morning, Ms. Hofmeyer. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chair. Are we ready? We are indeed. Okay, let's start. Thank you. I uh, can just confirm. Ms. Gwinana, you, the oath you took yesterday continues to apply today. You understand that? It continues, Chair. Thank you. If I can just check that Ms. Mbanjo is ready, I see that she's still yes. um, moving some yeah, files. Let her get settled first. No, 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 that's fine. No, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Ms. Quinana, I'd like to move uh, this morning to the 30% set aside policy which you referenced in your evidence yesterday and which I understand from your affidavit uh, in response to the chairperson's regulation 10.6 directive is something that you felt strongly about while you were at SAA. Is that correct? Yes, Chair. Can you tell us about it, why you felt strongly about it, what it was envisaged to do? Um, it was intended to empower the black people and as we all know that uh, uh, South Africa, black South Africans have long been in a disadvantaged position and therefore the 30% set aside was intended to at least make sure that the gap is being bridged. Thank and you. in fact, as I said yesterday, the 30% set aside was too little considering the demographics of South Africa. So if it had been up to you, it would have been more than 30%, oh, yes, is that correct? Yes. And uh, I understand from your affidavit that you made particular reference to a memorandum of understanding that was concluded with the Department of Trade and Industry. Can I take you to that? Yes. Uh, Chair, that is in Exhibit DD33, and it's back in Ms. Um, Quinana's affidavit which is Exhibit 1 there from page 4. Thank you. Um, and if you can just tell us about, um, at, at page 4, in your paragraph addressing Ad B, which is entitled the 30% set-aside policy adopted by SAA during your tenure on the board of SAA, you explain there uh, the role that the MOU played. Could you explain that to us today, please? Um, I would need the copy of the MOU. I, I'm going to, it's actually the first annexure to your affidavit, but Ms. Uh, Quinana, you might be aware, the version that you gave us was a version that was unsigned, and then we asked if you had a signed version, and as we understood it from your uh, representative, Ms. Mbanjwa, you, you didn't have a signed copy to hand, is that right? That's correct. So we managed to get a signed copy from the DTI, um, so I would like to just beg leave to hand that up, if I may. Chair, I suggest yes. that we mark it Exhibit DD33.22 because that will be the new numbering. And then if I could also ask if we could just hand one to uh, the legal representatives and uh, Ms. Quinana. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Quinana, please feel free to take a moment just to take a look at this. This you'll see on the last page of the uh, document. Just one Apologies. second. Uh, Ms. Hoffmeyer, you were asking me to admit this yes. as exhibit um, BB 33.2. Cor uh, sorry, point 22. Mm. Apologies. 22. Yes. Okay. The Memorandum of Understanding between the Department of Trade and Industry and the South African Airways. Um, Chair, we might want to say uh, signed on 18 May 2015, because yes, that's the that's signature what I'm date. Sorry, it's for. on the last page. I'm looking for the date here. Yes. Uh, signed by. Uh, did they sign on the same date? Uh, there isn't a date filled From, in by yes. Ms. Mieni, but there is actually later correspondence that refers to the 18th of May, so I'm yes. fairly so confident. I say, I say the 
Memorandum of Understanding between the Department of Trade and Industry and the South African Airways, SOC LTD, signed by Mr. Mzwandi Lemasina, Deputy Minister, on the 18th of May, 2015, and uh, signed by Ms. Dudumieni, Chairperson of the SA Board, is admitted as Exhibit BB 33.22. Thank you, Chair. I'm indebted. Ms. Quinana, have you had a chance to look at this version? Yes, Chair. Thank you. So if you could just uh, tell us what role this memorandum of understanding on your version uh, played in the 30% set aside. Um, this memorandum, if you read in the record... May, maybe shall we start with uh, getting clarification whether it's a exactly the same as the unsigned one that she provided, or are there differences? There are some differences, yes. As material? Uh, yes. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. No, I just so why to don't you that. give me both of them? Then, I sir? said where the other one was. It's your annexure to your affidavit. It's uh, tab two at page 11. I interrupted while Ms. Quinana was trying to answer a question. I'm sorry. So uh, you can continue, Ms. Quinana, with your answer. Uh, Chair, considering the fact that uh, Ms. Hofmeyer is saying there are material differences between uh, the two, uh, can she point it to me, those differences, so that I can be okay. able to respond? Okay, no, that's fine. She will do that. So, you see, the challenge we had when the unsigned version was provided as an annexure to your affidavit was that on its face, it appeared to be incomplete. And I'll give you an example. If you go to page 15 of your bundle, DD33, and you look at clause 4 there, 4.1. Sorry, the reference again. Page 15, 1.5 of exhibit DD33 which is within the memorandum of understanding that Ms. Quinana provided to the Commission. Admittedly, she confirmed she didn't have the signed version. But this version, do you see on page 15, at clause 4.1.5, there's a question mark. Page 15, 4.1.5. Yes, do you see that there's a question mark there? Yes. And then also further down on the page, you'll see at clause 4.2.6, it's open, it's left blank. Mm. So when the Commission received this from you, our impression was that this was unlikely to be the final version. Would you share that impression? Yes, sir. Yes. So when I say the material differences, there are differences because this, I think we can all accept, is in less than complete version, and then the signed version that we were able to obtain is the completed version. Mm. Do you see that? Mm. Yes, if you'll sir. just say yes, thank you. So if I could then return to my question, uh, what so, role... So, uh, sorry, before you go mm. to the question, are you saying those are the only differences between this signed version and the unsigned version? Yes, the clauses that seem to have been not completed on the version that you provided to the Commission are then filled out in the signed version. I see. Those are the two differences. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So Thank if you. we can return to the question, what role did the MOU, in your understanding, play in the 30% set-aside policy? Maybe then before, I will stick so to the unsigned version, which I saw. Can I quickly read it? Oh, well, that's, that's what I wanted, mm -hmm. wanted to find out, whether you ever saw the signed one. No, Chair. I will stick to the unsigned version that I submitted. Yeah, but did you or did you n never see the signed one before? Is no. it the first time you see it? Yes, Chair. Oh, okay. I just Ms. wanted Quinana, to clear that. Um, are you sure that you didn't see the signed version? Because if you're not sure, you may want to say you're not sure. Yes. But if you are sure, please do tell us. Yeah. You're absolutely sure you didn't see the signed version. Mm. I'm sure I didn't see the signed version. Okay. I'm, 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 so, I'm sorry, what was that last sentence? You did Chair, not... I didn't see the signed version. Okay, I will right. stick to the unsigned version. Okay, all right.
Do you want Ms. Hofmeyer to repeat the question? Or, or um, you still can remember she it? allow me to read the unsigned version first? Because I was reading the signed version, Chair. So can she allow me to read the unsigned version? And then she repeats the question after I have read the unsigned version. But you would have uh, read the unsigned version when you, send, when you attach it to your affidavit. Yes, Chair. I want to read it again. Sorry? I want to read it again, Chair. Uh, was, was the question, Ms. Hofmeyer, how the MOU influenced her decision or the board's it influenced decision? the 30% set-aside yes. policy because I understood her, under her affidavit oh. to say it did. Okay, have a look then, Ms. Uh, Guinana. Thanks, Chair. Um, in fact, Chair, all this record here, from number one uh, to number seven. On the unsigned MOU? On the unsigned MOU. Uh-huh. What about it? Supports uh, the black economic empowerment, basically. Now, as I said in my affidavit, the 30% set aside is intended to make sure that it bridges the gap between the blacks and the whites, so to say. Yes, but I'm, I'm focusing in on the 30% set aside. Where in this memorandum of understanding is the 30% set aside identified? It's not going to talk about the 30% set aside as the others, the other companies implement 51%, the others would implement 30%, the others would implement. So basically what this means is the guideline and then the implementation. Therefore, the 30% that we were talking about at SAA is the implementation of this MOU. Um, Ms. Quinnan, is it your evidence that when uh, in other SOEs there was a focus on providing opportunities to uh, bidders or suppliers who were more, 51% or more, let's call it broadly, black owned, that was the same as the 30% set aside policy that SAA adopted? It may not be implemented exactly the same, but the end result, I would think that it is intended to achieve the same objectives. Yes, but the implementation is quite important because I, as I understand, and it's reflected in the name, set aside, the idea, and we've had evidence on jet fuel and how it played out in jet fuel, and we've had evidence on how it was playing out in Swissport, was that 30% of contracts would be directed to those who qualified for being BEE partners of the main contractor. Have I described it accurately? Uh, how we intended to implement it, if, if we were successful in implementing it, remember that we were not successful in implementing this 30% set aside. Mm. And therefore, if we were successful, this is how we would like it to be implemented. Yes. We would say, for instance, um, cleaning has been done by a white-only company previously. And then we would say 30% of that cleaning, when the tender comes, 30% of that cleaning should be set aside so that black people can participate in the 30% set aside. That is how we intended to implement it, had it not been met with resistance. Right, and it was met with resistance. We'll come to that in a moment. But do I have your evidence to be the MOU itself doesn't speak to the 30% set aside? Is that correct? The MOU talks about the promotion of economic opportunities to previously disadvantaged South Africans, which basically would be implemented by putting aside the 30%. Yes. So basically, uh, 
much as it does not talk exactly about the 30 percent here but the whole aim is exactly the same mm. but you res you faced resistance both from national treasury and from the dti when you tried to implement the 30 percent because they said that would be unlawful didn't they yes yes, yes sir. um and Part of the reason I suggest that they would have said it was unlawful was because of a term of the MOU that was signed. So let me take you to that, if I may. Um, it's the one that we've handed in this morning, and that's been marked as Exhibit DD33.22. You see those uh, clauses that weren't complete on the unsigned version that you gave us mm. are completed on the signed version, and you'll find them at Clause 5 which is headed obligations of the parties. Sorry, 33 point. Uh, Ms. Quinana, it's the document handed up this morning, so it won't oh, be in your the, file. The signed one, yes. the signed one, yeah, clause the signed five. One, mm. And you need to find clause five in that agreement. Do you have it? Yes, sir. Uh, it begins at clause 5.1 with the DTI's obligations, and then at 5.2, it sets out SAA's obligations. Do you see that? Yes. Sir. And if you go over the page to clause 5.2.3, could you read for us what is recorded there as SAA's obligation? <coughs> Engage with suppliers who have expressed an interest in supplying goods and services to SAA within the selected product categories to gain insight into challenges experienced and to expedite resolution to such challenges. All such engagements remain subject to SAA's supply chain management policy and due procurement processes. So it's based on that clause that I say uh, the DTI and National Treasury regarded the 30% set aside as unlawful. Because what SAA was obliged to do here was to comply with supply chain management and due procurement process. And as I understand the advice that SAA received from National Treasury and the DTI, the Section 30% set aside policy would not be in line with those requirements. Is that your understanding as well? Yes, Chair. Yes. Oh, one so, second. Ms. Mbandra? Uh, I just wanted, thank you, Chair. If uh, Ms. Ofmeyer could also read for the witness paragraph 5.24 of the document. Thank you. Paragraph 5.2.4 reads, review existing contracts of SAA in order to develop a transformation roadmap, uh, roadmaps for selected procurement categories. Do you have a comment on that? No, Chair. Thank you. Um, so we, we have the same understanding of National Treasury's basis for resisting the 30% set-aside policy. If that one, is... One second, Ms. Hoffman. Mm. Ms. Mbandra, with regard to that, when you re-examine, you could say, when Ms. Hoffmeyer read to you, this is what she read, but read this section and then see what the witness has to say. So it could easily go into re-examination. Okay, all right. Let's continue. So we both have the same understanding that National Treasury and the DTI regarded the set-aside policy as unlawful because it was inconsistent with existing procurement policy framework and legislation. And so I wanted to ask you, why then did you persist in implementing it or seeking to implement it? Um. Chair, we wrote to National Treasurer and requested for guidance in respect of this implementation of the set-aside. Mm. It should still be noted, or maybe again be noted, that we could not implement the 30% set-aside. We wrote a letter to National Treasurer to say we need guidance. Mm. Yes. They responded and said it is unlawful. So why did you persist in trying to implement it? We wrote it. We did not implement the 30% set aside. We did not implement the 30% set aside. We wrote to National Treasury and said we needed guidance on how to implement this 30% set aside. Yes. 
we did not implement No, I didn't ask whether you implemented it. I said, after National Treasury said to you it is unlawful, why did you try to implement it? No, no, no. We tried to implement it before we were reprimanded by the by National Treasury. Okay, well, let's look at that. Let's go to the letter from National Treasury, and for that purpose, you'll need to go to Exhibit DD 1919A. DD 19. Sorry, where do I get DD 19? Oh, um. It's just on your uh, right hand, uh, left hand side, Ms. Quinana. They were put there uh, in anticipation this morning. Nineteen. Um, Nineteen. And then where we'll need to go in nineteen is page one three two point one six. So one three two point sixteen. Yes. Before we look at the letter, um, I'd just like to spend a moment on the evidence of Dr. Dawa before this commission. Did you follow that evidence? Yes, sir. You did. Uh, Dr. Dawa gave evidence to the commission that he had uh, concerns about the unlawfulness of the 30% set-aside policy. Were you aware that he had those concerns? No, Chair, he did not say that when we were trying to implement the 30% set aside. He didn't the say... The concerns, I had the concerns in this commission because uh, Dr. Dawa was going with us in respect of uh, this whole empowerment and uh, we were not aware that he was concerned and in fact if he was concerned, he would tell us why and then correct and guide us so that we could successfully implement the 30% set aside. Well, his version before the commission is that uh, he had a lengthy uh, engagement with you and Ms. Mieni on Friday the 2nd of October in which he made it clear to you that he could not in his conscience sign letters that would uh, facilitate the 30% set aside. Are you saying that none of that evidence was true? That's not true, Chair. Where would be the letters? Where, the letters that he would sign, where would they be coming from? I'm not aware of those letters that he would sign. Okay, because he said in his evidence that one of the reasons he was concerned about the set-aside policy were these very letters that we're going to go to, the National Treasury letter and the uh, BEE Commissioner's letter from the DTI. Uh, you said that you didn't continue to seek to implement the 30% set-aside policy after receiving the National Treasury letter, and I said to you that we would go and see whether that was indeed the case. Because you'll see at page 132.16, that's the National Treasury letter. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what it is dated? Uh, Chair, before that, can I get copies of those letters that uh, Dr. Dawa did not want to sign? Well, for, for now, you're not being asked about them. Uh, just tell, uh, read the date of that letter, and then if and when it's important to deal with those letters, we'll take it from there. Ms. Mbandra? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I would like us to get an undertaking that we would receive those letters. I don't want to hold the... Wait, meeting. those letters might not really be important for now. Yes. So let's see if and when they are important. Yes, but, but Chair, they go to the probity of the evidence of Dr. Darwin. Yes, but just wait. For now, the question is about something else, about what date this letter is. Ms. Quinana, do you want to, to, to read the date? 
of that letter, that letter from uh, the National date Treasury. Is 28 September 2015. Sir. Yes. That's the date we were focused on yesterday because I said that there was a fateful week at the end of uh, September, early October 2015. 28 September is the date on which the board of SAA met, and you made that decision to cancel the LSG Sky Chefs award and give it to Air Chefs. Do you recall that? Yes, Chef. So that was the Monday of the week. This letter comes from National Treasury. Uh, could you tell us who at National Treasury writes this letter? Miss um, Simshe. No, it's written by somebody from uh, the National Treasury. Who is that? Oh, Kenneth Brown, Chief Procurement Officer. And he's addressing it to? To Miss Simshe. Who was the acting chief executive officer of SAA at the time, correct? Yes, sir. And what I'd like to just focus on there is it's the response to the letter. That's the letter where you sought guidance. Is that correct? No, sir. Uh, this is not the letter that we, that we sought guidance. Um, in fact, how it happened was when we, we were trying to implement the 30% set aside, um, in the newspapers, Bidvest was complaining that uh, they are forced to 30% set aside and so on and so on. Was complaining? Bidvest. Okay. Bidvest. Yes, sir. Um, and then we received the letters from National Treasure and from DTI and uh, saying that uh, they've been informed about this 30% set aside. And then we responded as the board. So basically this is not the letter that we responded to. We responded to as the board to Kenneth Brown, because he wrote us a letter, not this one, but he wrote us a letter and then we responded. I think you might be confusing this with the letter of the BEE Commissioner, but we'll come back to that. This one says in the one, two, three, the third paragraph, decisions that are taken by the board to encourage transformation in procurement are commendable. However, the SAA board must not operate outside the procurement legal framework. The resolution of the board to set aside the 30% in its current form is not supported by any procurement legal framework and must be stopped with immediate effect. Let's just stop there for a moment. The board had already taken by this stage a resolution to implement the 30% set aside, had it not? Yes, sure. Yes. As I have it, that was on around the 25th of August 2015. Does that uh, accord with your recollection? Yes, sure. Yes. So you decided you were implementing it. Then there was this issue that was taken up. And now Treasury, as I have it, unless you disagree with me, is writing here to uh, SAA, addressed to their chief executive, uh, chief, uh, acting chief executive officer, saying that the resolution of the board to set aside the 30% in its current form is not supported by any procurement legal framework and must be stopped with immediate effect. You are kindly requested to advise the board not to take procurement decisions that bring the name of SAA and National Treasury into disrepute. And then he concludes by saying, kindly update me on the development around the 30% set aside of key procurement transactions. So uh, both Ms. Mshe and Dr. Dawa indicated that this letter was brought to the board's attention. And despite that, on the Friday of that same week, there was an interaction with Dr. Dawa, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, do you confirm that you met with him on Friday, the 2nd of October, 2015? Um, I cannot confirm, Chair, but as I said, uh, if you can give me the minutes of that meeting with Dr. Dawa, I may be able to remember. As I understand it, there were no minutes. He was called up to, I think it was the sixth floor of the Airways Park building on SMS from you. Do you recall that? 
an SMS from me? Yes. What did the SMS say? Um, his evidence was that you, he was called to a meeting on the sixth floor of Airways Park building. What did the SMS say, Chair? No, I'm telling you his evidence. His evidence is that the meeting, he was called to a meeting on the sixth floor of the Airways Park building. By an SMS message? Yes, from you. How do I call him by an SMS message? That's not my question. I'm asking whether you sent it, whether you have any recollection of sending it. No, I, uh, I, I can't call him by an SMS message. Definitely. Right. Um, and his evidence is that he began the meeting with you and then you were joined by Ms. Mieni. Do you recall that? No. So did this meeting take place at all on your recollection? Well, maybe, Ms. Maybe, Mayor. maybe you can give me the minutes of the meeting so that I can remember that, yes, the meeting did take place and this is what was discussed. Ms. Quinan, I've oh. just said it. My understanding is there aren't any minutes of that okay. meeting. I, I thought uh, maybe if you remind her what the issues were that were discussed mm, sure. at the meeting that might help her to remember I'll do that. If, if she remembers the meeting. Mm. Well, she certainly has indicated already, Chair, that she did uh, observe the evidence of Dr. Dawa. Yes. So this was set out there. But let me do so for completeness yes. purposes. And yes. I'll summarize now. And for the record, it appears in Dr. Dawa's transcript uh, on the 28th of June, 2019. And it commences at page 168 of that transcript. Dr. Dawa's version of that day is broadly the following, that you sent him an SMS calling him to a meeting on the sixth floor of Airways Park building, that you asked him how far he had got with implementing the 30% set-aside policy, you asked in particular about Swiss port, Ms. Mieni walked into the meeting at a point and asked you for an update and you said that Dr. Dawa was not doing enough to implement the strategy. Uh, Ms. Mieni then said she wanted to advertise Dr. Dawa's job. Uh, he was then told to go back to his office to draft awards for the set-asides for Swissport and for NGEN. Swissport was uh, the particular um, uh, contract that would have involved an entity called Jamicron in the ground handling that was to be concluded with Swissport. Uh, and so he went and he drafted letters of award, but he refused to sign them because he said it was against his conscience to do so. And the chair then suggested, that's Ms. Mieni, that it should be drafted for the acting CEO, Ms. Mshe, to sign. At that point, Ms. Mshe joined the meeting. You, Ms. Mieni, and Ms. Mieni, as Dr. Darwin's evidence goes, tried to convince her to sign on the basis of telling her that Swissport was in favor of this arrangement, and she refused to sign it and eventually said that she had to leave because by now, the meeting was getting late in the day. On Dr. Darwin's version, it had started in the morning and we were now towards the end of the day. And his evidence is that when Ms. Mshe was leaving, she said the following to him. Um, well, I'm going to quote from Dr. Darwin's yes. transcript, but he talks about what Ms. Mshe says, but I'll try and make that clear in how I, how I convey it. Yeah. So Dr. Darwin says this in his evidence before the commission. But before Ms. Mshe left chair, I need to confirm, she said to me in front of the two board members that, Dr. Darwin, you will be alone in court should this thing come back. And if you know this is wrong, you do not do it. Yeah, she insisted. And the chair tried to sweet talk her and say, no, but you know, if anything is to come back, it will come back to me as the chair. Then Ms. Mshe still insisted that Dr. Dawa, with all your qualifications, experience and credentials, you will have to answer to this one day. And in my view, if you contend and if you are quite satisfied that it is the wrong thing to do, please do not do it. And off she went. That was his evidence. He described the day as involving psychological games. He went on to give evidence to the commission that he was told by Ms. Mieni that the EFF 
would be there on the Monday at SAA and that they wanted to get rid of people like Dr. Dawa, who were anti-transformation, because they, and that they wanted to get rid of Zimbabweans. And he also testified that he, that you, Ms. Quinana, said to him that he and Ms. Mshe were going to suffer and that he would be disciplined. So that is his version of what happened on that day. Uh, what is your response? I think that's the day where, where he says the meeting started around about 10 in the Correct. morning. And by 4 o'clock, yes. the meeting was still continuing. It was still continuing and went on probably to 6, because that is when Ms. Mshe said she had to leave to go home. Yes. So we calculated a total of eight hours on yes. his version. And, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, he said uh, at some stage, I think he was asked to go to his office uh, and he cried or something. Mm. Uh, he, w he certainly spoke about being distressed. About chair. being distressed. Yes. Maybe he didn't cry, yes. but uh, yes. was very distressed yes. about uh, the demands that uh, he said were being made on him yes. by Ms. Quinana and uh, Ms. Mieni. Correct. I think yeah, that's the mm. day here. Ms. Quinana, do you remember that meeting? Um, I don't remember the meeting at all, Chair. That's why I was saying, uh, I'm sure for such a long meeting that would start at 10 o'clock and end at 4 o'clock, there would be minutes that would be approved by the people who are in that Ms. meeting. Ms. Quinana, Chair. if what Dr. Dawa says you and Ms. Mieni were doing in that meeting to her, that was wrong. And if, it, if you were doing something wrong, you were not going to have minutes for that, for that meeting, obviously. So okay. not every meeting has got minutes. And certainly min meetings where illegal things are being done, wrong things are being done, people don't keep minutes generally. Definitely, Chair, in this meeting I was not there. You say you were not there? I was not there. Are you sure? that you have a clear recollection that you were not at that meeting or is the position that you can't remember maybe you were in that meeting maybe you were not definitely chair i was not in the meeting if i was in the meeting i would remember mm. such events mm. so you don't have any recollection of him saying to you that his conscience would not let you do what you were demanding of him? I definitely no. But, not on, but uh, as I understand your evidence, uh, you are not saying you can't recall. You are saying that did not happen because you were not in that meeting. That did not happen, Che. Okay. And did you ever come to learn that he was resisting signing letters of award to facilitate the 30% set-aside policy because his conscience would not allow him to do that? Uh, Chair, I, I don't even understand these letters of awards um, that Dr. Dawa is talking about because the letter of award would emanate from a due procurement process. So that's why I wanted to see these letters that Dr. Dawa was refusing to sign. Um, Ms. Quinana, they wouldn't emerge from a due procurement process because one of the contractors that you wanted to implement the 30% set-aside policy was Swissport. And as we traversed at length yesterday, in 2015 and 2016, no procurement process was followed at all for Swissport. So there would be no procurement process what there was on the evidence that we looked at yesterday and in the lead up to this um, meeting was a decision by the board of SAA on the 25th of August to implement a 30% set aside policy. Communication from National Treasury on the 28th of September 2015 that that must be stopped with immediate effect. A meeting on Friday that week on Dr. Darwin's version where he was pressurized into doing so and implementing it um, and your response saying that he was going to be disciplined and that he would suffer and then thereafter shortly thereafter he is disciplined he is removed and he is replaced 
Ms. Quinana, who replaced him? Who replaced Dr. Dawa? One second, Ms. Mandra. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want you to give us a chance, Chair, to re-examine on this point. Uh, the evidence leader, Ms. Hofmeyer, has the evidence of yesterday incorrectly. There was a procurement process for Swiss Port, but we'll leave that for re-examination. She is wrong on evidence. Okay, all right. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, who replaced Dr. Dawa? Um, Lester Peter, rep rep I, I don't, I acted in his position. Yes. So when Dr. Dawa was suspended for the disciplinary charges that were brought against him, Mr. Lester Peter took his position, correct? Yes. And Mr. Lester Peter is the person who sent on the 15th of December, we looked at last, uh, yesterday, the 15th of December 2015, that tripartite agreement that was going to be concluded that you said you hadn't seen before between Swissport, SAA, and a yet-to-be-selected BEE supplier who was going to get 30% of the contract. Do you remember seeing that for the first time yesterday? Yes, sir. Right. So where we are at the moment is you, I understand, I couldn't understand how a letter of award could arise in this circumstance, and I'm putting to you that set of facts makes it clear to me at least how it could arise. It was a board decision that this policy would be implemented, and now you were checking up on whether it was being implemented. Do you have a response to that? Uh, Chair, at SAA, the letter of awards arise from a due procurement process. That's why I am surprised about these letters of awards that Dr. Dawa is saying he refused to sign because the award letters would come from a due procurement process. So when uh, uh, Mr. Lester Peter sent the draft contract facilitating the 30% set-aside policy uh, of the board on the 15th of December 2015, was he acting irregularly? Was that signed, Chair? Uh, in That's not fact, my question. In fact, before we can say he was acting irregularly or not, we need to take the process up to the time that he has to sign. Now the process would be, was there a tender? Was it advertised? Was the procurement process followed? Was the award given? Was the contract awarded? Was the contract signed? So all of these. And then, and therefore, we would say, if, for instance, there is a draft that does not talk to that whole process, then that is irregular. What's your knowledge, Ms. Quinana? Did a procurement process uh, proceed the 15 December 2015 uh, draft agreement that was sent to Swissport by the acting procurement officer of SAA? Uh, Chair, that agreement, a uh, draft agreement, I saw it for the first time here. That was not my question. To your knowledge, was there a procurement process followed before that agreement, which I accept your evidence yesterday was you saw I for the first know. time yesterday? I don't know, Chair. Right. But you would have wanted to check before any agreement was entered into with Swissport because you're concerned to ensure that procurement is properly followed. Is that correct? Yes, Chair. Um, so let's go back to your evidence that you have no recollection of that meeting. You say it didn't happen. Is that your version? Yes, sir. You say it was not communicated then or since then that Dr. Dawa could not, in good conscience, do what you were asking him to do. Is that correct? I'm saying, Chair, I definitely was not in that meeting. No, I'm asking a separate question. Did it ever come to your knowledge that Dr. Dawa was saying he could not, in good conscience, do what you were requiring of him to do? When he was testifying here, yes, sir. Yeah, that's the first time it came yes. to your knowledge. Is yes, that sir. correct? Yes. Okay, let's go to an email that you wrote to Ms. Mieni a few days after your 2nd of October meeting. You will find that in Dr. Darwin's bundle. I don't think you've had that before. So if we could just have assistance. That is Exhibit DD16. 
and we'll pick it up at page 240. Um, let's maybe start at page 239, actually, if we may. On Dr. Dawa's version, the meeting that lasted for uh, eight hours or thereabouts, and he described as having involved psychological games being played with him, was on Friday the 2nd of October. Now, what you find at page 239, Ms. Quinana, is an email that you sent to Ms. Mieni on the 12th of October 2015. Do you see that? Yes, sure. And you say, uh, its subject is complaint letter, and you say, Dear Chairperson, please find my letter of complaint, which is self-explanatory for your action. Best regards, Yake Quinana. And then if you go over the page is the attachment to that email. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Do you recall this uh, letter of complaint? Yes, sir. You do. Yes. Well, the letter of complaint suggests that some of the evidence you've given this morning, Ms. Quinana, is false. Uh, the first thing that indicates that your evidence is false is because you begin the letter with, Dear Chairperson, May 18, 2015 was a historic day for South African Airways where you signed a memorandum of understanding on behalf of SAA with the Department of Trade and Industry, committing SAA to support DTI industrialization. Your evidence earlier was that you had not seen the 18 May 2015 MOU. Do you remember giving that evidence? Yes, sir. You clearly had seen it, had you not? Yes, sir. Yes. So that evidence was false. What you then go on to do is you talk about uh, President Zuma's State of the Nation address and his reference to 30% set aside. And then I'd like to pick it up in the last paragraph of that page before the numbering starts. Because this is where you start to lodge your complaints against Dr. Dawa. Mm. You wrote the following. Having noted all this, it is sad for me to seek answers from you, Chairperson, where in particular I would like to report the following about Dr. Masimba Dawa. One, he lied that the jet fuel tender is inclusive of six streams, whereas on further inquiry the jet fuel tender is just supply of jet fuel. I used the above lies to communicate that this tender has six streams to SMMEs to whom the board awarded the 15% tender of jet fuel. So I'm just going to pause there. We did have evidence back in June of last year about how there were steps to implement the set aside in the jet fuel context. I'm just reminding us that that is where that comes in in the evidence of the commission. Yes, okay. She go, uh, Ms. Quinana, you go on at uh, three. These lies that I communicated to a room with more than 60 people has an effect on bringing my name, the chairperson's name, SAA and the government's name into disrepute as there are now inquiries where service providers want to know the way forward in respect of logistics and other streams as communicated by myself as per the me misleading information provided by Dr. Dawa. Four. He also lied and made the chairperson to believe that the award letters to tenderers were signed, whereas there were no letters. Those are the award letters that a moment ago you said you had no knowledge of and couldn't exist because procurement would have to be followed beforehand. Paragraph 5, when asked about the status of the board resolution's implementation, he lied and said that the delays are with legal. 
I subsequently asked legal who informed me in the presence of Dr. Dawa that they are waiting for Dr. Dawa. Six, he traveled with us on transformational roadshows and when we were communicating the board decisions. He also clapped hands, knowing very well that he would not write the award letters, which I later discovered that he would not write as he said, quote, my conscience does not allow me. Let me just pause there. A moment ago, Ms. Quinana, you gave evidence that said you did not know that that was his issue with the award letters until you heard his evidence in this commission. I put it to you that your evidence earlier was false. What is your response? Uh, Chair, I had forgotten about uh, this letter that I wrote. Uh, in this regard, I have clearly, read... Clearly, in, this, Ms. In this, in this regard, Chair, I stand by the letter that I wrote. Sorry, I what? Really you stand what? by? The letter. By the letter that I wrote. I don't know what okay. that means. Okay. What does it mean that you stand by? It? Because it's a completely different version. Does that mean you now remember the meeting that you said uh, you did not attend? I still do not think that was the meeting. I think all these things uh, transpired through the road shows, not through the meetings. Okay, let me try uh, this. Previously, at my request, Ms. Hofmeyer read Mr. Dr. Dawa's evidence, you know, a substantial part to indicate what according to him happened at that meeting. The idea behind that was that that could help you remember whether you, whether you were part of that meeting. You said you definitely were not part of that meeting. So now Ms. Hofmeyer has referred us to a letter or email that you sent to Mr. Dumieni in which you refer to um, Dr. Dawa uh, and uh, the award letters. And of course, his evidence was that uh, he refused to sign uh, two award letters. And uh, here you refer to him having uh, said his conscience did not allow him. And that seems to, uh, what's written here, seems to tie up with what Dr. Dawa says according to the evidence that was read by Ms. Hofmeyer uh, about a meeting where he says he was required by you and Ms. Mieni to sign two letters of award, uh, award letters and uh, uh, his conscience would not allow him to, to do that and uh, he was distressed and so on. But at least there are references here which suggest that you seem to or you may have known about some of these things. Uh, what do you say? Um, Chair, I would uh, remember one of, I don't know whether to say the award letter or the agreement. Uh, maybe it would not be the award letter. The reason why I'm saying it would not be the award letter is because I remember very well uh, the one for the jet fuel where basically Engine agreed that from the supply that they are giving to SAA, they are willing to dispose of 15% of that supply and give it to the smaller companies. So which means therefore that the agreement between SAA and Engine, where the tender process was followed, would still continue as it is. And therefore, that's why I'm saying maybe it's not, it's not an award, it's an agreement between now Engine and the BEE companies. Then that one, our understanding and Dr. Dawa made us to believe that he is going to lead it. 
And uh, please, Ms. Hoffman, understand that the award followed a procurement process from the beginning up to the time that Engine was awarded that tent. And then now we negotiated with Engine to say, can you please, from the remaining tender, from the remaining period that is uh, remaining pro to the expiry of your contract, can you give 15% to these black companies? In fact, I remember that there were about 60 odd black companies that uh, were knocking on SAA's doors to get the tender. And therefore, Dr. Dawa. But, was, mm, but does all of this, are you saying all of this to say you remember the meeting and you did attend it? Or are you saying all of this to say you did not attend the meeting? No, Chair, I did not attend the meeting. It was not the meetings. Yeah. We were doing the road shows throughout yes. the country. And oh. then mm. and then now we would in fact discuss like with a, a hall full of people to say this is how this thing is going to happen. So basically I wouldn't say uh, there was a meeting, especially the meeting that uh, Ms. Hofmeyer was talking about. So basically what I was talking about, what, what was Dr. Dawa promised that now that we have negotiated with Engine, Engine now can give the 15% out of their own will. Remember that this is about negotiations because the company that has got the tender with SAA is Engine and therefore we cannot enforce anything that's why we were negotiating with Engine and the other companies and Bitvest. So basically, Dr. Masimba Dawa was supposed to say he does not want to do that. And in fact, if he said he does not want to do that, remember that the procurement process is not tempered with in this, in this exercise that we were doing. Uh, Ms. Hofmeyer, before, but before that, Ms. Mbandra. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, I just want to put on record that on my own evaluation, I do not believe that this letter, this email that has been written by Ms. Quinana, is a confirmation of the fact that there was that meeting. No, Ms. Mbanjwa, that, that you can deal with in re-examination. Now it's like you are telling the witness how to respond to questions on no, this I letter. I was going to ask, Chair, that if Re we can begin Reserve it for re-examination. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you don't have to ask for it. I'm give, I'm, I've told you I will allow you to re-examine uh, 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 when the witness has, when Ms. Mayor has finished. Um, so so you, you don't have to ask for it each time. I will give you the opportunity. What I don't know is whether it will be today or it will have to be some other day, depending on when we finish. Okay. So you just make a note of all the issues that you want to clarify during re-examination. Re okay, all right. Ms. Quinana, I, I do want to just spend a little bit more time on this meeting because, you see, it's not a meeting if it occurred that I want to suggest to you could easily be forgotten by the people involved. And the reason I say that is if Dr. Darwin's version is correct, and I might add the part of the meeting where he says Ms. Mshe joined him, Ms. Mshe confirmed in her evidence, right? But that type of meeting that caused such psychological distress to one of the participants is not a meeting that people easily forget. I want to put that to you. Would you accept that if somebody in a meeting experiences severe psychological distress by it and it lasts for eight hours, it's not the type of meeting that people easily forget having been part of? Chair, I also would not forget that meeting. Right, right. That type of meeting would be in your memory, would it not? Yes, sir. And your evidence today is, despite having seen this email that was written seven days later on the following Friday, you still maintain that you did not attend that meeting with him. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 
Right. And do you also maintain that he was not told at that meeting that the EFF were going to be coming to SAA that next Monday and that he must be fearful because they were there to act against people who were anti-transformation and foreigners, Zimbabweans like him? Did that not occur? Sir, I was not at that meeting. Did that not occur? I was not at that meeting. I don't know if it did occur or not. I was not at the meeting. Right. You see, Dr. Dawa was so distressed by that threat that he did not go to work the next Monday. And instead, he wrote an email to his line manager, Mr. Wolf Mayer. He copied it to Ms. Mshe, who had attended the meeting with you on the 2nd, the previous Friday, and he referenced that meeting and he referenced the fact that he was too afraid to come to work. Does that not jog your memory at all? Not at all, Chair. Right, so your evidence today is despite your own email on its face referencing the things that he said took place in that letter, in that meeting. And a subsequent email I'll take you to now in which he talks about the very threat and the fact that he met with two board members the previous Friday. You still maintain to this commission you did not participate in that meeting? Yes, sure. Right, let's go to the email. It's a few pages back in the uh, witness bundle of Mr. Darwa, which is DD16, and you'll pick it up at page 236. 236. Yes. Two three six, the same one. DD sixteen. The the Doctor Dawa one. So contemporaneous evidence at the time. This email, written at seven forty seven in the morning on Monday the fifth of October, by Doctor Dawa to Mr. Wolf Mayer and Ms. Tulliam Shea says the following, Dear Sir, following the meeting between the two board members and I on Friday 2 October 2015, I was advised that EFF was coming to Airways Park today, Monday 15 October, uh, sorry, 5 October to demonstrate. I was advised that they will be demonstrating that there is no transformation at SAA because of people like me in senior positions, as there is no South Africans holding such positions in Zimbabwe. Seeing the recent violence against foreign nationals, I feel endangered. As you are aware of these demonstrations by EFF and that they are targeting, quote, people like me who are non-South Africans yet holding senior positions at SAA, end quote, question mark, I do not find it safe to proceed to the office this morning against the advice I was given by the two board members I met on Friday. I await your advice and direction. Do you still persist that you didn't attend that meeting? Ms. Yes. Quinana, yes, sir. I need to put it to you that you have been dishonest with this commission. Well, uh, uh, before that, Ms. Quinana, sure. just reflect properly. Here is a situation where a senior member of the management of SAA, Dr. Dow, has given evidence along the lines that Ms. Hofmeyer read to you earlier on about a meeting where he says you and Ms. Mieni uh, demanded and pressurized him to sign letters of awards that he considered to be wrong, to be illegal. He said his conscience would not allow him. He said he was very distressed. And um, uh, he says Ms. Mshe came in at some stage at the meeting. And Ms. Mshe has come before this commission and under oath confirmed that she came and uh, into the meeting and you and Ms. Mieni were there with Dr. With Dr. Dow. And she has confirmed um, uh, that part of the meeting that uh, happened when she was there. Now, Ms. Of May has referred you to an email dated 5 October 2015 from Dr. Dawa to 
uh, his uh, uh, supervisor or whoever, Mr. Wolf Mayer. Monday the 5th, the 5th of October was the Monday. The meeting that he's talking about, he says, happened on the Friday, about three days before that. So everything is fresh in his mind. He's writing to, some, to his senior. And he talks about having had a meeting with two board members on that Friday. He, in the email, he doesn't mention who they are, but he has mentioned in the evidence who they are. And, uh, and he says that uh, uh, you uh, told him that uh, the EFS was going to have a demonstration uh, against people like him holding senior positions in SAA who were anti-transformation and foreigners. And why would this man fabricate all of this against you? What, what did he have against you to fabricate all of this? Uh, because if you were not in that meeting, it means he is fabricating all of this. Um, so I just want you to reflect properly whether really you are saying, you're sticking to your evidence that you were not in that meeting, or whether when you reflect properly, you may have been in that meeting or you were in that meeting. The chair, mm. there is no way that I would forget such a meeting. I was not in that meeting. So Dr. Dawa is just falsely implicating you in what happened, in what he says you and Ms. Mieni did or said to him in that meeting. He is false, falsely implicating me, Chair. And uh, Ms. Mche, to the extent that she confirms at least some of those things that happened while she was at that meeting, she is also falsely implicating you. Yes, Chair. Uh, Ms. Hofmeyer, you had asked a question. I'm sorry. I just no. wanted to give. Uh, I wanted to give uh, Ms. Quinana really an opportunity mm. to reflect and decide whether she sticks with mm. her evidence that she was not at this meeting. Mm. But you, you. And you, I was simply going to follow that chair by indicating mm. to Ms. Quinana that we will likely argue in due course that you have been dishonest in the evidence you have given in resisting against all this overwhelming evidence pointing to the fact that you were there. You nonetheless doggedly insist you aren't, you weren't, and that that is false and dishonest. What is your response to that? I said, Chair, I was not in that meeting. So if you want to say uh, what I am saying is false and dishonest, it's your own prerogative, Chair. Let's then go, you, you were very, you said you stand by the letter that you wrote on the 9th of October that you've been shown now, is that correct? Yes. Sir. That letter, as I read it, and I want to check if we have the same understanding, expresses a level of animosity towards Dr. Dawa that I would describe as extreme coming from you. Do you agree with that assessment? No, sir. It's not extreme animosity. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Let's read what you said. Uh, let's go to page 241. It's in the same bundle. We're in DD16, and it's just the second page of the letter that you wrote to Ms. Mieni on the 9th of October, 2015. Can I just, before we go to what you wrote, you say it doesn't express extreme animosity to Dr. Dawa. Uh, how would you describe your feelings to Dr. Dawa at that stage? No feelings at all. Chair. None at all? 
No. No. He was just the head of procurement and you were just dealing with him like you would deal with any manager. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's see what you said to Ms. Mieni. We'll pick it up at the bottom of page 241. Uh, under the bullet points, you say, from the foregoing, it is clear that there's no commitment of, on the part of Dr. Dawa to the resolutions of the Durban Roadshow. Sorry, sir, where, where is Apologies. That? So we're at 241. You'll see some bullets mm -hmm. sort of two-thirds of the way down, and I'm reading from the paragraph below that, mm. from the foregoing. Mm. From the foregoing, it's clear that there's no commitment on the part of Dr. Dawa to the resolutions of the Durban Roadshow. No positive outcome has eventuated since we went on a roadshow, judging by numerous inquiries from would-be service providers that have gone unanswered. The situation as it presents itself amply demonstrates that Dr. Dawa is hell-bent on sabotaging and derailing the transformational agenda of the present government in general and that of SAA in particular. While the SAA board is doing all in its power to translate government's intent of economic empowerment into concrete reality, to extricate the African majority from the quagmire of poverty, Dr. Dawa is equally doing his best to keep the same people in economic bondage. He is part of a sinister, retrogressive agenda which is aimed at reversing the transformation agenda of the present government. His behavior smacks of insubordination and conspiracy against the SAA board. His purulent attitude may be located in the fact that he does not share the agony of the people of South Africa who have emerged from centuries of economic deprivation and whose freedom was born of struggle. It is actually ironic that he's sabotaging SAA that appointed him to such a senior position, essentially biting the hands that feeds him. This leaves me with no other option except to recommend that the strongest possible action be taken against him. Ms. Quinan, I put it to you that that is not written about somebody in respect of whom you had an indifferent attitude, as your evidence a few moments ago suggested. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I still take it Chair, as indifferent in the sense that um, there will always be some disagreements between uh, the junior and his or her senior. But that doesn't mean that uh, there is a, what words did you use in animosity? Mm. No. So these Ms. are just Ms. average. Quinnan, I'm sorry, Ms. Mayor. Are you saying to me, you want me to believe that you had no strong feelings against Dr. Dawa when you wrote an email in such strong negative terms? This email is written in very strong negative terms about and against Dr. Dawa. You want to tell me that you did not have any strong negative feelings towards him? Uh, Chair, from time to time, there will be disagreements between the senior and the junior. No, I know that, Ms. Quinana. Don't, don't tell me that. My question is, are you saying to me that the strong words you used here, negative words, about and against Dr. Dow, don't reflect that you had st strong negative feelings against him. Is that what you want me to believe? Yes, sir. Continue, Ms. Hofmeyer. Well, before you proceed, yes. let me ask this question. I mean, Ms. 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 Quinana, you say in this paragraph that Ms. Hofmeyer read, you say in part, while the SAA, you say, from the foregoing, it is clear that there is no commitment on the part of the Radawa to the resolutions of the Devon Roadshow. No positive outcome has eventuated since we went on a roadshow judging by numerous inquiries from would-be service providers that have gone unanswered. 
the situation as it presents itself amply demonstrates that Dr. Dawa is hell-bent on sabotaging and derailing the transformational agenda of the present government in general and that of SAA in particular. While the SAA board is doing all in its power to translate government's intent of economic empowerment into concrete reality, to extricate the African majority from the quagmire of poverty, Dr. Dawa is equally doing his best to keep the same people, that is the African people, in economic bondage. This is an African person that you're talking about. This is a person from Zimbabwe. Brothers and sisters who have suffered under colonialism, who have suffered under, under the white rule. This is, this is an African person that you are talking about, Ms. Quinana. You are saying, while you are trying to empower economically black people in South Africa, you are saying he is doing his best to keep African people in economic bondage. You say he is part of a sinister, retrogressive agenda which is aimed at reversing the transformation agenda of the present government. His behavior, you say, smacks of insubordination and conspiracy against the SAA board. You say, his attitude may be located in the fact that he does not share the agony of the people of South Africa. He's from Zimbabwe. He has suffered, just like the African people in South Africa. Sure. Anyway, uh, let's go to page 241. Uh, bullet point number three. You say that you recommend that the chairperson, chairperson, chairperson should charge Dr. Dawa with, and I go to bullet point three, a refusal or failure to carry out lawful and reasonable instruction. What are you talking about there? Um, Chair, this uh, lawful and reasonable instruction um, would relate in this previous uh, tender that I talked about, uh, the jet fuel specifically, where basically we managed to negotiate 15% from engine to be shared by 60 odd uh, black fuel suppliers. So basically, what uh, I was saying here, um, a refusal or failure to carry out lawful and reasonable instructions. Who had given this instruction that you're talking about to him? She wa he was given by the board. Who in the board conveyed the instruction to him? Or was he called to a board meeting and and uh, the board told him uh, the instruction? No, Chair, as, uh, as I said, there were roadshows. And in the roadshows, there would be commitments. And in those commitments, like for instance, we would go and speak to this example, Engine or Shell. And no, no, I don't want that whole uh, history, Ms. Quinana. What I want is, you said here the chairperson should charge him with a refusal or failure to carry out a lawful and reasonable instruction. I'm asking the question, who conveyed to him this instruction that you say he failed or refused to carry out? 
It's the members of the board, Chair. Which members of the board? Uh, the board takes a collective decision, Chair. Sorry? The board takes a collective decision. Did they so, all convey this instruction to him? Yes, Chair. At a meeting? No, not in the meeting, in the, in the road shows that we were attending. So the, the, there was a road show where all the board members were present and they all gave him this instruction? They may not necessarily be all present, but most of them would be there. And in fact, and in fact, Chair, when these road shows happened, the board members who were in the road shows had a mandate from the other board members. That's why I am saying this instruction basically was from the board because even if it was two or three or four board members that attended, you were, they would were you one of those board members? Yes, Chair. Was Miss Mieni another one? Yes, Chair. And what was the instruction again? Just tell me in clear terms. The instruction was that considering that the board has gone to negotiate with Engine, and Engine has agreed from their contract <clears throat> to put aside 15%, that means if they were supplying 100% of the jet fuel, they would supply 85% and 15% would be supplied by the 60 odd black companies. So basically, Engine, with their uh, procurement process, they had agreed. So basically, what Dr. Dawa was supposed to do, Dr. Dawa was supposed to make sure that the 15% that has been agreed by Engine, remember that other companies did not agree, that's fine, but at least those companies that agreed that, okay, then we can supply 85% and then 15% you can take. So Dr. Dawa was supposed to carry out that mandate, the mandate of going to Engine and say, Engine, you agreed on 85%. Here are the companies. Which law said you could do this, Ms. Quinana? It, Which law said award an entity um, uh, business with, uh, without that entity taking part in a procurement process? Chair, the procurement process was done and then now we negotiated with engine. No, 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 no. You, what you have said to me is you, 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 you instructed Mr. Dr. Dawa to award a certain entity, 15% no, of, of a business that was supposed to go to, no, to another Dawa, one. Dr. Dawa would not be in a position to do that. What, what, what did you want him to do? That's what I'm explaining, Chair. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying, asking what did you instruct him to do? We wanted Dr. Dawa to carry forward from the negotiations that we made with Engine, where Engine was saying, we are giving away 15% so that SAA, you can be supplied by black people. Do you mean carry forward? What, was, what in practical terms was he supposed to do? To carry forward, uh, What was he what supposed I mean, to do? What I mean by carrying forward is because negotiations had happened with Engine, and Engine agreed that 15% will be supplied by the black firms, by the black companies. And therefore, Dr. Dawa needed to make sure that the agreement between Engine and the other companies do happen. What was he supposed to do? He was supposed to call a meeting, if I can be like, say, line by line, what he was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to call a meeting with Engine as a follow-up of what they agreed previously. 
Mm -hmm. Call a meeting with Engine. Call a meeting with all the six companies. Put all of them together in the room and say, uh, Engine, as you agreed, here are the companies that are going to supply the 15% of the jet fuel that you are giving away. Why did he have to do that? That was part of uh, pushing the transformational agenda from the side of SAA. Which law said he could do that? Even if there is no law, Chair, but what, that is how we were pushing the black economic empowerment in, uh, uh, in, in SAA. You see, that might be the problem, that you don't care whether there is a legal framework within which you are, you are acting. You say, even if there is no law, we'll do it. That might be the problem. Ms. of Mayor, continue. Um, Chair, I would actually, if I may, just like to pick up on one final point arising from your question. You see, what troubles me, um, Ms. Quinana, you articulate the charge as being his failure to follow lawful and reasonable instructions mm. in line with the set-aside policy. But you see, you wrote that letter to Ms. Mieni on the 9th of October 2015. And on the 28th of September 2015, SAA had been told by National Treasury's Chief Procurement Officer that this whole set-aside policy was unlawful and had to stop with immediate effect. So how could Dr. Dawa, in good conscience, if he was concerned about acting lawfully at all, ever have acted on that instruction? Um, you know, National Treasury here was talking about what was supposed to be implemented by SAA. This one that I am talking about, about the 15%, remember that it's not supposed to be implemented by SAA, like the procurement process of SAA, because we have already uh, negotiated with Engine, and therefore, that does not have anything to do with the 30% set aside. The 30% set aside that we were talking about that was never implemented is the 30% set aside by SAA. Remember that this 15% was not going to be set aside by SAA. It was going to be set aside by Engine. Chair, we're at 11, and we did start earlier this morning. I wonder if it's convenient to take the break now, or I'm happy to go on. It's entirely uh, up to you, Chair. I, I think let's go on it. Uh, let's take the break at quarter past. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, um, can Quinn I have a comfort break, Chair? Yes. Sorry? Comfort break, Chair. Oh, okay, all right. No, then we will have, when a witness says comfort break, <laughs> we will have a comfort break. Uh, okay, we'll, uh, we'll just take the tea break. We'll, we'll resume at quarter past 11. Thank you, Chair. We are Jen.
Okay, let's continue. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Quinana, towards the um, end of the first session before our break, we were looking at that letter that you'd written to the chairperson on the 9th of October. And in that letter, you called for Dr. Darwin to be charged with those various uh, charges that you'd set out. Do you know what then happened? Was he disciplined? Oh, if you'll just turn on. Uh, sorry, just if you'll repeat your answer again. Yes, he was disciplined, Chair. Um, and did you note from his evidence before the Commission that in the process of his disciplining, he entered into a settlement uh, with SAA? Were you aware of that? No, Chair. And were you aware of his evidence where he indicated that, pursuant to all of those events, he ended up losing his house that he'd bought with his family in order to be able to settle here when he was employed as procurement manager? I'm not aware of that, Chair. And th did, were you also aware of his evidence? Because I did understand you previously to say that you had watched it. He also gave evidence that he, as at the date of his evidence, which was June of last year, had, had great difficulty back in Zimbabwe uh, seeking employment. Were you aware of that? No, Chair. Um, Ms. Quinan, I picked up on a point earlier, which was the point about who was Dr. Dawa replaced by, and we, you confirmed for us that was Mr. Lester Peter, and I indicated to you one of the first things that Lester Peter did was to circulate the 30% set-aside agreement to Swissport to facilitate the policy there. Um, and you then have meetings with Swissport in early 2016 about that. Were you not concerned that pushing the 30% set-aside line was unlawful and you shouldn't be persisting with it by that stage? Uh, Chair, we did not implement the 30% set-aside. Uh, Ms. Quinale, again, remember, I absolutely take it for today's evidence that you weren't ultimately successful in implementing it. I'm asking about when you're in the throes of trying to implement it. That's why I said, didn't you, weren't you concerned that you were pushing for the implementation of the 30% set aside at a time when National Treasury had told you it was unlawful? Chair, so we pushed the 30% set aside before the National Treasury said it was unlawful. When National Treasury said it is unlawful, then we stopped immediately and we said to the National Treasury, give us guidance. You didn't stop immediately because on the 15th of December 2015, Mr. Lester Peter, the person who replaced Dr. Dawa, sent an agreement that Swissport was required to sign, setting aside 30% of that contract. Your the, comment? The 30% set aside by Swissport is not the 30% set aside by SAA. We have got nothing to do with the 30% set aside by Swissport. We are nothing at Swissport, of, or let me say, I am nothing at Swissport. And therefore, I wouldn't push the 30% aside to be implemented by Swissport. However, I would push the 30% set aside to be implemented by SAA if it was not allowed. But we couldn't push it because National Treasury and DTI did not allow for us to do that. No, but Ms. Quinana, we looked at that agreement yesterday. It said they must set aside 30% and SAA is going to retain the revenue of the 30% and give it to the BEE partner of its choice. How, how can that not be pushing for the implementation of the 30% set aside? Uh, the 30% set aside that we are talking about is the 30% aside that would be implemented by SAA. If Swissport wanted to do to push their 30% set aside, we as SAA did not feature anywhere in their policies of pushing aside the 30%. Ms. Quinana, it was a tripartite agreement. That means there are three parties to it. SAA, Swissport, and the yet-to-be-named 30% percent 
BEE partner that SAA was going to select. Ms. Quinana, how could SAA not have been involved in that? Chair, I'm not going to comment on the tripartite uh, uh, agreement that you showed me yesterday. I was not aware of that until you showed me yesterday. And therefore, I will talk about the SAA trying to push the 30% set aside as SAA, not Swissport doing their 30% set aside. So you well, weren't... Well, you, you can't not comment when you said SAA was not involved and Ms. Hofmeyer says to you, but SAA was party to an agreement that sought to put aside 30% that it wanted to give to another entity that was yet to be named. Uh, so what, what, don't you agree that if SAA was involved in such a party, such an agreement was a party to such an agreement, that was involvement by SAA? Uh, Chair, the tripartite agreement, I was not aware of the tripartite agreement. You were and not I aware said, of it yes, as an individual. Said, yes, and I said yesterday, it was my first time to see the draft agreement uh, that uh, Advocate Hofmeyer showed me. But you agree that the fact that SAA was party to such an agreement means that it was involved in setting aside or it sought to set aside the 30 percent all you might say is you were not aware of it but that was involvement uh, my knowledge chair of the 30 percent set aside i i have tried to explain it that the 30 percent set aside that saa was trying to implement was never implemented. The tripartite agreement... No, no, Ms. Hofmeyer has explained more than twice that she accepts that uh, the actual implementation might not have happened, but there were efforts to try and implement the 30% set aside, and that's what she's talking about when she refers to this agreement. So the question is, do you not agree that if SAA was party to such an agreement, then SAA was involved in attempts to set aside, to, to implement the 30% set aside? Uh, uh, Chair, I do not, I don't even want to comment about the tripartite agreement. Well, the agreement that I can talk about is the agreement that we would envision where this 30% set aside would happen. Ms. Quinana, when you are asked a question and you don't answer it, or you don't want to answer it, it doesn't speak well of you as a witness. It's the kinds of things that Ms. Hofmeyer may in due course rely on to say you were evasive as a witness, to say you were dishonest. When you were being asked a question and you, you knew the answer, but the answer would be inconvenient, you then decided you would decide to say I'm not commenting instead of being honest and say, this is the answer, even if it is inconvenient, even if it doesn't put you in a good light, but because you are an honest person, you give the answer. When you say, I'm not going to comment, and you start giving uh, an answer to a question that has not been asked, it doesn't say, uh, it doesn't speak well about you as a witness. So I'm going to ask you the question again. Would you not agree that if SAA was party to such an agreement, 
then it was involved in attempts to implement the 30% set aside. Um, for the sake of progress, Chair, let me say yes. Sorry? For the sake of progress, let me say yes. You mustn't say for the sake of progress. You must say, give an answer that you honestly believe is, is the correct answer. If, if you say for the sake of progress, it gives me the impression that you don't believe honestly that that's the correct answer. And I don't, I'm not asking you to give me answers that you don't believe to be true. All I want from you is honest answers. If, if, you're, if, if you truly believe that that was not involvement or in efforts by SAA to implement the 30% set aside, you say so. Uh, uh, Chair, as I said, that tripartite agreement, is, it was the first time for me to see it. And therefore, for me to comment and say it was an effort uh, uh, for the involvement of SAA, I really do not think that I would be in a position to confidently say so, considering that I was not even aware that there is a tripartite agreement. Ms. Mayor. So can I just get clear, if we move away from the tripartite agreement, is your evidence that you yourself did not take any steps after, let's call it late September 2015, to advance the 30% set-aside policy of SAA? No, uh, after we received the letter mm. from uh, DTI and we responded, then we never tried to push for the 30% set-aside. I want to be very specific because you've answered with we and I want to focus particularly on you. Okay. Right. Did you ever, after the National Treasury letter of 28 September 2015, try and push the 30% set aside? No, Chair. You did not. You did not hold any meetings with Swissport, and let me just step back for a moment. We discussed the 10 February 2016 encounter yesterday. But can I just have your evidence as to whether you were involved in any other meetings to facilitate a 30% set aside between Swissport and a BEE partner for Swissport? No, Chair. You did not? No. You're absolutely certain about that, Ms. Quinana? Yes, Chair. Okay. Um, right. We were talking about Mr. Lester Peter. Maybe just to make sure, just in case the... Uh, transcript uh, doesn't catch that. That last answer was yes, yes, yes. Is that right? Correct. Ms. Quinana, your last answer was yes. I did not uh, have any other meeting with Swissport. You, you, you did not take part in pushing for the 30% set aside after the National Treasury had sent its letter saying the 30% set aside was unlawful. Yes, Chair. Yeah, okay. And convene no meetings with Swissport and a prospective BEE partner. Your answer was no, you did no. not. Uh, thank you. Uh, one second, Ms. Hoffmeyer. Uh, Ms. Mbandra. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want clarification from Ms. Hoffmeyer. I, please, if I heard you incorrectly, just correct me. Uh, the document which you are referring the witness to, is it that Swissport agreement that appears in DD19? 132.45. I'm not referring her to any document. No, uh, not now. I think you were talking about a document where you said that there was an agreement which you referred her to yesterday. It's the tripartite agreement. I just want to make sure that I've got the same. Sure. Uh, let me oh, find it for you. The, uh, it's not the IATA standard ground no. handling. No. Not that okay, one. Can, I, can I please get a reference to that? I will allow her to continue. I just want to get the reference correctly. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, should I maybe provide it at the break? Yes, Sorry, it's yeah, just yes, not fine, at the yeah. top of my mind. Or would okay. you like it now? Uh, okay. No, it's fine. After break, I will just ask for the document you are referring to. Certainly. 
Oh, sorry. No, I can do it quite swiftly. I think I have the right one in front of me. And then this You'll find one. it in the Mamela, Ms. Mamela's bundle, which is DD um, 25A, and you'll find it at page 291. And then the second thing which I just want to confirm, were you saying that in that 30% set aside, it was said that SAA would choose the BEE partner? Chair, I, I really, I mean, I'm happy to give a reference, yeah. but Ms. Mbanjwa must please pay attention yeah. to the questions that I ask. Yes. I'm not here to clarify for Ms. Mbanjwa. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Chair, can I please respond to that? Yeah. Uh, because it's one of those things which I just simply cannot accept. I have a right if I do not hear a, a question. I've been instructed by the chair whom I respect not to make interruptions. If I don't understand a question, I have to ask for the question to be repeated. It does not matter, Ms. Hofmeyer, how irritated you become. It's a right I have. Just Thank to, you, just to uh, uh, bring this to finality, yes, there was a reference that SAA uh, uh, said they were going to choose the BEE partner. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's continue. Um, right. So we were talking about the replacement of Mr. Lester Peter taking the position of Dr. Dawa. Uh, are you aware that Ms. Mshe was also disciplined? Yes, sir. And who was she replaced by? Uh, by Ms. Musa Zwani. And what By Mr. Who? Musa Zwani, Chair. Okay, Ms. Quinana. Please remember to look this side as you answer so I can hear. Okay, Mr. Musa Zwane. Okay, all right. And that was towards the end of 2015, is that right? Maybe early yeah. 2016, I think it was. Uh, so what position did Musa Zwane hold then? He was the CEO of South African Airways Technica. Musa Zwane? Yes. No, but he was replacing Ms. Mshe. Ms. Mshe was the acting CEO of SAA, correct? Yes. So he took her position, which is acting CEO of SAA. Is that yes. not correct? That's correct. Sorry, you referred to SAA technical. So no, she was saying, she was saying uh, before okay. Mr. Zwane took Ms. Mshe's acting Apologies. position, he was CEO of SAA technical. Sorry, I did misunderstand it. Can I make sure that I understand? So... Ms. Mshe was acting CEO of SAA, right? Yes. At the time that she was in that position, did Musa Zwani, Mr. Musa Zwani hold a position anywhere? Yes, sir. And what was that? Uh, he was the CEO of SAA team. Right. Thank you, Chair. And then Ms. Mshe is suspended for disciplinary processes to run, and then Mr. Musa Zwani takes over her position. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So then he becomes acting CEO of SAA. Is that right? Yes, sir. And who was going to fill the CEO position at SAAT, albeit on an acting basis? Uh, the acting position was taken by Mr. Malola. Malola Piri, yes. We've heard some evidence from him previously and about him. So towards the end of 2015, early 2016, we've got... Mr. Malola Piri as acting CEO of SAA Technical, and we've got act, uh, Mus, Mr. Musa Zwani as acting CEO of SAA. Have I got that correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Musa Zwani was the person who signed the Swiss Port Agreement, the IATA one that Ms. Mbanjwa was asking about earlier and that we saw yesterday. Do you, do you recall that? No, sir. You don't. Well, in his position of acting CEO, I assume it wouldn't surprise you that he would be the signatory to that agreement, correct? That's fine. Yes. And that was the agreement that was the culmination of the efforts with Swissport to uh, pursue the 30% set aside. Is that correct? Um, I don't know where does the 30% set aside uh, feature within... Swiss port agreement. You'll remember that I took you to two clauses yesterday. I agree with you, it doesn't talk about 30%, because on Mr. Cole's evidence, they would not accept that. 
But eventually, by March 2016, what they would accept are those clauses 8.1 and 8.2 that required them to partner with 51% black-owned companies in certain of the performance under the contract. And then you'll recall that important clause 8.2, which was the one that required them to buy the SART GPUs. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. Sure. Right. So that's why I say that is, in a sense, the culmination of as far as the 30% set aside got in, at its implementation. Do you accept that? I don't know if that was the culmination of the 30% set aside. Uh, my knowledge of uh, Swiss Port on its own is that they are be compliant. Mm. So now, if you are talking about Swiss Port and the 30% set aside, then uh, that's where I am not understanding it. Mm. They were already BEE compliant, weren't they? Yes, that's what yes. they said. Mm. Mm. So it wouldn't make sense for them additionally to have to part with 30% of their revenues to a pre-selected uh, supplier, would it? Yes. And then... Oh, sorry, Ms. Murray. Oh, sorry. Uh, Chair, I'm sorry to launch an uh, objection. We have paragraph 8.1 and 8.2 here in this page 132.49. There is absolutely nothing about it, the 30% set aside. That's for re-examination, Ms. That is Murray. a wrong question to put to the witness. Uh, the record will show, Chair, that I said oh. in exact terms oh. that I was aware it didn't refer to the 30%. Oh. And then I went on. The record will show that. Um, let's then go. Are you aware that three days after Mr. Zwani was put into the acting CEO position at SAA, after Ms. Mshe had left, that he signed a Section 54 application to National Treasury uh, that Ms. Mieni had tried to change the structure of the Airbus swap transaction with? No, I'm not aware of that, sir. You see, the reason why I'm focusing just a little bit on these positions that involved replacements of persons, Ms. Quinana, is because the Commission over the last two years has heard a lot of evidence about people who within state-owned entities tried to resist efforts of unlawful conduct taking place, then being required or, or, or pushed out by various means and then replaced by others who were either more compliant or participating in those unlawful efforts. I would like to ask you whether you think that that occurred at all with the replacement of Dr. Dawa with Mr. Lester Peter and the replacement of Ms. Mshe with Mr. Musa Zwani. Definitely no, Chair. And can I ask you, was there any corruption and fraud, to your knowledge, that took place at SAA and SAA Technical while you were on the boards? Except for the ones that uh, are appearing in the open water reports. Not beyond that. And that, as I recall, it was the, the one you referenced yesterday was the spare parts uh, investigation. Is that right? Yes. So on the components tender, you say, if I understand your evidence, there was no corruption involved? Not as far as I know. Not as far as you know. Thank you. I'd like to go to that tender, if we may. That's the uh, components tender that ends up being awarded in May of 2016 to the joint venture of AAR and JM Aviation. Now, there are allegations and we've heard evidence before this commission, so it's even, in a sense, more than allegations at this point. The commission has received evidence that there was corruption involved in the appointment of J uh, JM Aviation and AAR as the ultimately successful bidders in that tender. Are you aware of that evidence? No, sir. You're not aware of it. Um, can you tell us who Ms. Cheryl Jackson is? First, can I have this evidence where um, fraud and corruption happened? 
Uh, Chair, I'm Ms. certainly going Ms. to come to Ms. that. Ms. Gwenena, uh, the question or you are, you are being asked is to tell us uh, who Ms. Uh, Jackson is. Do you know her? I think it's the director of AAR. Of AAR. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Director of AAR. Oh, okay. And who is Ms. Kuki Mdlulwa? Kuki Mdlulwa was one of the consultants of SAA, um, legal consultants of SAA. Um, thank you. Sorry, I just need to make a note there. Now, you, I think, mentioned yesterday that you were aware of the evidence that Ms. Uh, Sambo gave before the commission. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you received a Rule 33 notice in advance of her evidence. Yes, sir. And at that point, you sent in a response uh, that was just a statement. It wasn't an affidavit. As I understand it, you weren't legally represented at that point. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. You said in that statement... Sorry, let me go back first, because you asked me where are the allegations of corruption and fraud. Now, Ms. Sambo's evidence was that in a meeting that you had with her, you said to her you wanted to get your hands on three big contracts before you left SAA. Are you aware that she gave that evidence? Yes. And she also said that she had a second meeting with you at which you introduced her to someone whom you called Ihashi. That person was Ms. Mdlulwa, who we've just discussed. And Ms. Sambo's evidence was that at that meeting, you said that you were going to demand a payment from AAR for yourself, for Ms. Mamela and Mr. Zwani. Do you recall that evidence? Yes, sir. Chair, just for record purposes, that can be found in Exhibit DD18, uh, page 19, paragraphs 60 and 64. We don't need to go there. Now, you did deny those allegations in your statement that you provided to the Commission. Um, I can take you there if you'd like me to, but the part of it that I'd like to pick up on is you said that Ms. Sambo is a, quote, pathological liar. And it was she who was the Ihashi for AAR. Do you remember saying that in your statement? Yes, sir. Can you just expand on that a bit? Why is she a psychological liar? And why is it she who was the Ihashi? Um, the reason why I'm saying she is a pathological liar is because all the things that she said were untrue or were false. If you think about it, Chen, Ms. Sambo was dumped by AAR 2014 if I think, was dumped in 2014. And then now, it's my first time to meet with her. I call a meeting and Ms. Sambo is saying, Ms. Memela said, I want to be introduced to Ms. Cheryl Jackson. And then she is saying, that is, to, that is in the last quarter of 2015. My understanding of the last quarter in 2015 is October, November, December 2015. And now in May, few months before that, we went to Chicago. Our host was Ms. Cheryl Jackson. And then now I go to Ms. Sambo and say, I need to be introduced to Cheryl Jackson. That is the, 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 the blatant lie. Now I call her and then I get uh, to her house and say uh, and stay for about 10 minutes and say I want uh, to get my hands on this tender and this tender and this tender. And then I go and then I arrange a meeting. That's the first time for me to meet with her. And then I arrange a meeting at Protier Hotel. And then at Protier Hotel, the meeting is between Dr. Dambi, who is the board member of SAA, myself, uh, Ms. Mluli, and 
Ms. Sambo. And then I say in this meeting, I want to lay my hands on three contracts. I want to get a hundred million from AAR. And the people who are going to benefit for this is myself, Ms. Swane, and Ms. Memel. Now, a reasonable person would ask a question as to why was Ms. Mluli here? Why was she the, uh, herself uh, Ms. Sambo? Why was Dr. Dambi there? If I am saying I need this, I, 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 will I will get this money from AAR. Now, that is blatant lies. And Ms. Sambo, in, his, in her affidavit, she had literally about 40 statements where she is saying she can't remember, she can't remember, she can't remember. And all of a sudden, she remembers that uh, in the last quarter of 2015, uh, I wanted to meet with her. So basically, that's why I am saying Ms. Sambo is such a pathological liar. And in fact, I did say she is so spoiled that she wants things, she wants to be spoon-fed. She doesn't understand the procurement processes. She doesn't know that if she did not put in the tender, she has zero chances of winning the bid. And another thing, she knows that she was dished in 2014. Now, if I wanted to get my hands on the tender, would, why would I go to her? For, for, for God's sake, how would I go to her and say, uh, I want 100 million? And the reason why I am saying he is the one, and in fact, she said when she came to, 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 to us to complain about her relationship with AAR, which basically was the reason why she called us, I said, let me arrange a meeting with, uh, with Dr. Dambi because I will be going anyway. So if you have an issue with SAA Technical, then let me arrange a meeting. And that was the reason for the meeting, basically. And then now, uh, so basically, uh, I really do not know why I would literally go to her and knowing that uh, she no longer has a relationship with AAR, and we met with AAR in May. And therefore, if I wanted 100 million from AAR, I would simply go to AAR and get that 100 million. Why would I go to her? That's why I am saying Spongile is such a pathological liar. And in fact, she did not even tender in that components tender. I don't know why is she disgruntled like that. And I understand that she, uh, Ms. Memela tried to assist her, but because she is such a spoiled brat, maybe she is used to getting things her way. But now, if you don't even put your tender, how, how was she expected uh, to win the tender? So basically, that's the reason why basically I did not even put an effort to answer her affidavit, because it is clear that she is a blatant liar. Thank you, Chair. What, 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 uh, what was the... meaning that you were attaching to the word Iashi? I think she may have explained, explained when she was giving evidence, but I, I've, I've forgotten. But uh, obviously, I know what the literal meaning of Iashi is. Uh, uh, and so, if that is Isizulu or Isikosa, um, that's a horse. Mm. But uh, there may have been a particular meaning uh, that it was that was attached to it. What was that? What Zbongile said in in our meeting when she was complaining about AAR. She said her relationship with AAR started as early as 2012. And she has been running around trying to get uh, AAR people. She got them to meet the department uh, 
think Department of Public Enterprises tried to meet with this person and this person tried to meet uh, with uh, people at SAA and therefore she has been running since 2011 and then now she is being dumped and therefore she has been a runner for all these years. So basically, Iyashe is a runner chair. So when she was telling me about this, I said, oh, and, and in fact, uh, uh, I, I, I said to her, oh, that means mostly you were Iyashe Labo, running left, right, and center, up and down for them. So, okay. yes. Okay, Ms. Hoffman. Thank you, Chair. As I understand Ms. Sambo's uh, allegations against you, Ms. Quinana, it's really that you were endeavoring to solicit a bribe from AAR. Do you understand her allegation similarly? I understand her allegations, but what she needed to do, she needed in. in she needed to prove that no. I wanted to solicit a bribe. That is number one. And then number two, she needed to, to, to tell me why should I go to her if I wanted to solicit a bribe from AER? Mm. Because at that time, there was no longer a relationship between her and AER. Mm. And if I wanted a bribe at AER, I would have gone to AAR. Mm -hmm. And Chair, I hope your investigators did go to AAR to check if I did solicit that bribe. Um, Ms. Quinana, my question was just whether you understood her evidence in the same way as I did, that she was accusing you of having tried to solicit a bribe. I understand you to agree with me. That is her claim against you, yes, correct? Yes, that is her claim. And I understand your evidence to deny that you did not at any point solicit a bribe in yes, relation sir. to the components tender. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Right. Do you believe that Ms. Mamela is a pathological liar too? I don't know. Okay. Um, could she be from your interactions with her? Uh, there was never an indication to me that she is lying or not. You see, she engaged in some WhatsApp communications with Ms. Sambo um, in around uh, 2017, in which she makes reference to your effort to solicit a bribe. So I'd like to take you to those WhatsApp communications so that we can have your comment on them. You'll find them in Ms. Sambo's bundle. Now, that is DD1818, and we will open it at page 540, 540. Well, actually, could we start at 539, just a page earlier? So the page is 539 of exhibit DD18. <clears throat> so this was um, a set of WhatsApp communications that Ms. Sambo provided to the commission. Uh, they start quite a bit earlier in this bundle, but the one that I'm interested in is the one that starts right at the foot of page 539. It's the last dated entry there. You'll see it says 2017 10 16, and the time is 2100 hours 47 minutes and 10 seconds, and then identified as the communicator on the WhatsApp there is Nonsasa Sart Mamela. Do you see that, Ms. Quinana? Yes, sir. Right. So 
This is a response that Ms. Mamela sends to Ms. Sambo, referencing a, an email that she got in the morning. I think I am going to read it all to the part that I'm interested in, Chair, just because I, it's helpful to get context for what's happening, if I may. So what it says there is, uh, this is Ms. Mamela writing to Ms. Sambo. She says, Sibongile, I'm really trying to analyze your email this morning. I'm not sure what your intentions are, but let me remind you of something. When you came to my office, I advised you to write a background of what work you did with them and what agreement you guys had in place and how you feel they owe you for introducing them to South Africa. I went as far as saying, make sure you break down everything you did for them and send them an email where you copy us so that based on that, we will intervene and schedule a meeting. But the email you sent today was intended for something else and it was nothing of what we discussed. So I'm really not sure what you were trying to achieve by that one-liner. You came with your partners for a meeting in 2014 and you asked for help first from the CEO who refused to give you the prices for the tender. And this is the part I'd like to draw your attention to. Ms. Mamela goes on and says the following. And in 2015, you came to me as a friend and asked for information for the short tender, which you wanted to give to your partner, but looks like you ended up not giving it to them since you wanted money up front. They tended anyway with your company name of, and that of Ndizani. You guys, in brackets yourself, Cookie Mdluli and Chair, were negotiating with Cheryl where there was an agreement of what amount was going to be paid out to you guys if there was success. Unfortunately, Cheryl changed her mind, claiming it was illegal in her country to pay out bribes. But anyway, they didn't succeed in that tender. Air France did. Do you see that? Yes, sir. So as I read that, and you tell me if you read it differently, Ms. Mamela is talking about an occasion in the past where you, Ms. Mdluli, and Ms. Sambo were trying to solicit a bribe from Cheryl Jackson of AAR. Do you read it in the same way as me? I read it in the same way, Chair, and I consider this as nonsense. Nonsense? Yes. You say you never ever solicited a bribe in relation to the components tender. Is that correct? Definitely. So why would Ms. Mamela just make this up in her private communications with Ms. Sambo? I don't know, Chair, and uh, I don't even know the people that uh, she is talking about here in Ndizani and, um, okay, Bongani, maybe we met at, uh, at Air France, but Ndizani, I, uh, I don't know, and I don't know Rafik, so I really do not know. Why would she write that? Thank you. I'd then like to move to the actual tender process for AAR. Uh, well, let's call it the components tender. They're ultimately successful on the last one, but there's a lot that happens in between. Were you aware that there were numerous tenders prior to the last one in which they were successful? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, and the final decision-making body on those tenders would have been the board of SAA Technical, correct? Yes, sir. Um, it was a contract valued at certainly more than a billion rand, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, and so it would fall within the delegation of the board, is that right? Yes, sir. And on the 9th of May, as I have it, that final decision was taken on the last of those tenders to award it to the joint venture of AAR and JM Aviation. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. Um, now, while some of the other tenders that preceded it were still open, you traveled to America to visit AAR's offices. Is that correct? Yes, sure. And because yesterday, sorry, I, I sort of hesitated in asking that question because yesterday in your evidence, at a point when we were trying to engage with you about the limits on communications between decision makers and bidders, I thought I heard you say, but it was okay when you went to America because the tender was not open at that stage. Yes, sir. Yes, so can I just get clarity now? 
when you went to America to visit AAR, was there a tender open in which AAR was a bidder? I'm not aware of it. You're not aware of. So when you said yesterday it wasn't open, you're not certain now whether it was or it wasn't. But definitely it was not the tender between AAR. That was won by AAR and JM Aviation. That we would agree on. So AAR in the, let me just get it right, had bid in the 29 October 2014 tender, not with JM Aviation. And that is the one that was still open, if you can believe it, in May of 20, sorry, in, when did you go? May of 2015. So it took really some time and it was still open. Do you accept that it was still open when you traveled to AAR? Yes, sure. You do. And in that encounter with AAR, Ms. Mamela's evidence was that you went on private jets facilitated by AAR, you had limousine rides uh, from time to time, and dined at expensive restaurants. Do you confirm that evidence of Ms. Mamela's? Mm, yeah, I, I wouldn't know about the expensive restaurants. Oh, of course. they might have just been restaurants, yeah. ordinary. Okay, but you don't deny the private jets and the limousines? Yes. Right. And I want to go back to where we were yesterday then, because you're a member of the board of SART that was going to decide that tender that was open at the time that you traveled to the US, correct? Mm, yes, sir. And notwithstand, oh, sorry, and AAR was a bidder in that tender, correct? Um, I didn't, I, I can't remember, but I would think that they would be the bidders. Mm, they were. I mean, if it's necessary, I'll take you to the letter, but let's, can we proceed on the basis that mm. they were, right? So you as the chairperson of the decision-making body go on this trip to the U.S., interact with a bidder while a tender is still open. Do you not regard that as irregular, Ms. Quinana? Uh, Chair, if I can quickly tell you about the, in summary, the summary of the tendering process. The reason why I would not even the reason why I would not even know that they Well, is let us start your answer with saying whether you regard that as irregular. If you say you don't regard it as irregular, then you can say why you don't regard it as irregular. I don't regard it as irregular, Chair. Okay, all right. The reason why I don't regard it as irregular is because for the board to know, the, the only time that the board knows about the tender that is going on is when it is at the final stage, at the final approval, only if the delegation of authority requires that it be approved at the board. And therefore, if there was a tender that was going on at the time we were in Chicago, I would not know if there is a tender going on if it hasn't been brought to the board. Do you not think that that is something that you should have been advised about? Um, no, I don't think so, Chair. Um, as I said, the, the, the tendering process starts from uh, identification of the need and then it goes to bid specification, and then it goes to bid evaluation. And all these people are different people, maybe there's one or two people who are common. And then there is a bid adjudication, and then there is ex committing, and then there is the board. So basically, I don't, at no stage was I advised that there is now a tender going on until the tender gets to the board. So I find it quite normal that I wouldn't know about it until it gets into the board. Ms. Mamela, who was the head of procurement at the time, joined you on that trip, correct? Yes. So you don't regard it as uh, concerning that the head of procurement 
who would have known that the tender was open didn't alert you to that fact before you took this trip? No, she, no, not at all. Um, and why would she not be required to alert you, given that you'd be the ultimate decision maker on the tender that was open? As I said, Che, there are many processes that would go up to there. You may find out that she may not even be aware that there, is a, there was also a tender going on. As the head of procurement, she yes. wouldn't know that? Most probably. For a contract worth more than a billion rand? She may not be aware because those contracts would happen. I don't know at what stage would she get involved. But what I am saying is, at no stage did she tell me with not a single tender that there is a tender going on. Mm -hmm. The only time that I would see that there was a tender is when it gets to the board. So you have no knowledge that the company of which you are the chair of the uh, board is out on tender to try and get uh, component services. You don't know that at any point in time until you're asked to make a decision on it. Is that your evidence? until I'm asked to make a decision. But maybe let me, let me go back to before the, the bid specification. Then there would be a board uh, submission that would say uh, the components tender mm. will be up for renewal. Mm. It's expiring on this date. And then we say, okay, then start with the process. Mm. When they start with the process, sometimes they would uh, uh, report that six months before the expiry of the contract because the process, the tender processes uh, take longer. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, when exactly the tender process is starting, as long as we know in the beginning, mm -hmm. and then the tender specification and everything, and basically, that one is just for noting mm. to say that there is a big contract that is going to expire, mm. that if it doesn't happen, it could have an impact on the operations of the business. So you are given forewarning when tendering will take place on big contracts, correct? Yes. Um, and in relation to this one in particular, the one that was advertised in October of 2014 and was still open in May of 2015, uh, the board became quite involved in that tender, didn't they? Because you took a decision to retract it at a point, didn't you? Um, not necessarily quite involved. Mm. The retraction also came as a submission mm. to the board. Mm. And all the reasons by management would have been stated until it gets to the board. Mm. So when you say quite, quite mm. involved, I tend to disagree with you on that. You're involved at the beginning, you know it's going out to tender, and you're involved when you're asked to take a decision on it, correct? Yes. Right. So in between, it would be fair to assume it's still open, correct? Yes, sir. Mm. So you did know that it was still open when you went to the US? You know, Chair, there are so many tenders at mm. SAA and SAA Technica, and as a result, uh, me as the as the member of the board, I do not have a book where I write that on this date uh, there was a notification that a tender is coming, mm. and then on that date the tender is is advertised, mm. and on that date no, mm. I don't have that. Mm. If they say we note that the components tender is going to expire in the next mm. six months and therefore we will go out to tender. We say yes, that is fine. Mm. So there are just too many tenders open at any point to keep your finger on one of them, correct? Exactly. Exactly. And so when you're going to go overseas to the premises... Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Hoffmeyer. Can we take a five-minute break? Of course. And then we'll come back. Thank you, Chair. We are Jen.
Okay, let's proceed. Um, Ms. Quinana, do you accept that being flown in private jets and driven around in limousines are benefits to receive? Uh, no, Chair. They are not benefits. Uh, we were required to go to AAR as part of the due diligence, and which has happened with many other companies, including Lufthansa, including Air France, including Rolls-Royce. Now, I don't consider that I received any benefit when they transported me in a private jet. I really do not consider that as a benefit at all. Uh, so, just tell us about the due diligence. What were you doing a due diligence on? For any company that we intend to, to work with, in a, at some stage, there was an MOU, non-binding MOU, that SAAT had with uh, AAR, which basically was intended to take SAAT uh, to the next level. And therefore, any company that we enter into part, as part of the due diligence, we need to make sure that it's the company that exists, it's the company that uh, is saying they are able to uh, do and meet our requirements. So it happens all the time. Um, and I accept that if you are embarking on a partnership with an entity, you'd like to know quite a bit about them. And is that what the due diligence was designed to achieve for SAA Technical? Yes, sure. Right. The challenge I have with that is that you took the trip before the MOU was entered into and while a tender was still open in which AAR was a bidder. Now, you've said previously you, there were just too many tenders open at any point in time to keep track of them. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Do you not think, though, as the chairperson of the board of SART that was ultimately going to make a decision on that tender, that it would have been required of you to find out. Just make sure that before you go and visit AAR in the US, there isn't a tender that's open in respect of which you will later be a decision maker. We were not going there, Chair, for the purposes of the tender. We were going there for the purposes of the partnership. And, and therefore, I didn't see any need for me, in fact, it never even rang a bell that mm. I need to go and check if there's a tender going on and if AAR has, has tendered. No, I didn't. And in fact, as I am sitting here, I really do not see any relevance in respect of that. So just to go back to the point that the chair put to you yesterday, I want to suggest what the relevance might be. You see, AAR was competing with other tenderers in that very tender that was still open. And as the chair put it to you yesterday, but if you go and have dinner at a restaurant with one of the representatives of a bidder and one of their competitors sees you there, they would be, I would suggest, quite fairly concerned about the fact that the decision maker is be meeting with their competitor. And so I'd like to put it to you that similarly, if the other tenderers found out that you were taking a trip overseas, aspects of which would be covered, the, the expenses of which would be covered by their competitor bidder, they would regard that as unfair in the process. Do you accept that that would be unfair? Uh, that would be unfair if SAA Technical did not do that to other tenderers. SAA Technical had been to Air France. Mm. SAA Technical had been to Lufthansa. Mm -hmm. SAA Technical had been to basically almost all the big uh, suppliers of SAA mm -hmm. Technical. So basically that was not uh, abnormal. Mm -hmm. But in a particular open tender, Ms. Quinana, I would put it to you that if only one of the bidders gets this opportunity to get close to you, to spend days with you while you're at their premises, to drive you around in limousines and put you on private jets, 
The other tenderers could fairly say, but we don't have that access to the decision maker, and that's inherently unfair in this process. Uh, Chair, as I said, SA Technica has been to all these bidders. Yes, but Ms. Quinana, do you know that they went to those other bidders when tenders were open, in respect of which there were other competitors? Then that would be tested. Chair. No, do you know? Do you know? whether those visits took place at a time when there were open tenders in respect of which there were other competitive bidders? I would not know, Chair, much okay. as I didn't know that there was an open tender at that time. Mm. That's yes, the you problem. See, Ms. Quinana, you said that uh, you going to AR uh, would be unfair if you didn't do the same to others. And you said um, you had done the same or the board had done the same uh, with others. But the two cases can't be the same unless you say in regard to the others the trips also occurred in circumstances where they were bidders in a tender that was still open. So if you don't have that information, then you can't use the other trips to the other service providers to justify, to say it was not unfair to go to AAR at a time when the, 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 the tender was still open. You, it's one thing to say whether you were aware, you are not aware that they were party to a tender that was open. Uh, I was not aware, Chair. Much as I was not aware if there was a tender open where AAR had been dead. But if Let, let us say, for argument's sake, you were aware. Would you agree that it would have been wrong to embark on such a trip at a time when the tender was still open, if you were aware? Uh, Chair, even if I was aware, I really wouldn't see anything wrong in us undertaking that trip. The reason being that there are rigorous processes that need to happen for uh, up, up to the stage where we get the recommendation. And therefore, that wouldn't uh, affect my decision whether I did go there or not. And in fact, maybe the tender that you were talking about, much as, as we went to AAR, AAR did not win that tender because uh, they had some uh, deficiencies in terms of the tendering process. No, so basically what I'm saying is that would not impair my independence and thinking. Ms. Quinana, do you really seriously mean what you are telling me? Yes, sir. That in your judgment, there would have been absolutely nothing wrong for you as a member of the board that would make a decision on a tender in regard to which AAR had put in a bid, for you to go on a trip overseas to their premises without the knowledge of other bidders and let them wine you and dine you over there. You say there would have been nothing wrong with that? Eche, the procurement processes are so rigorous, such that sure. even if I went to Chicago, if the bidder does not qualify, the bidder does not qualify. I think, uh, Ms. Quinana, uh, quite frankly, processes that, in terms of which people are appointed as board members to SOEs must be reviewed. If that is what you think, and you were the you are a board member, you are a chartered accountant, you think it would have been, 
there would have been completely nothing wrong with that, then there is something wrong in the appointment process. Ms. Hofmeyer. Ms. Quinnan, I want to pick up on a point. You, you recently said that it was okay to be there because AAR didn't win that tender. They ended up not qualifying, correct? No, Chair. I'm not saying it would be okay because AAR did not win that tender. Mm. I'm saying as part of the due diligence, mm. we had to go there. Why whether, did... AAR, whether AAR had bidded or not, our visit to AAR was not informed by whether AAR had bidded or not. No, but you... Our visit was informed by the partnership agreement that we wanted to enter into at that stage. So it was not informed by the tender. Even if AAR did not tender, we would still have to go to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to Chicago. No, of course. If AAR didn't tender, there'd be no problem with you going. On that, Ms. Quinana, you and I agree completely. The problem is that you go with one of the bidders, right? You are wined and dined by then, and then they weren't disqualified in this tender. Do you remember what happened with this tender? Um, I read in the uh, documents, mm. um, I mean, remember the, the facts maybe um, incorrectly, uh, but it seems as if uh, there was some uh, move to disqualify them. No, I think you might be confusing it. You see, because what happens is you go to America, you get wined and dined by AAR, you come back, and the board decides to retract that tender that tender in respect of which there were other competitors who might have been service providers to SAA Technical, and you decide to embark on the MOU with AAR. So your closeness with AAR led to a retraction of a tender in respect of which there were competitors to now form a partnership with AAR. Do you not regard that as problematic either? Uh, Chair, it was, it's not problematic mm -hmm. at all. Right, and if other competitors thought that the fact that you were in the US and being wined and dined by one of the bidders led you to cutting them out of potential supply to SAA Technical and forging a partnership with the entity that had wined and dined you, they wouldn't have any complaints of unfairness. Is that your approach? I don't know, Jay. Okay. You don't know what your approach is? I don't know if they would complain or not. No, I'm asking whether if they complained, they would legitimately do so. That would depend, Chair. It, 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 that would be proved in the court of law as it has happened with AAR and Air France, whether it is legitimate or not. We'll come back to the and litigation. And if you don't get to a court of law, yes, it's, it's, it's fine. Hmm? Chair. If you don't get to a court of law, it's uh, not a problem. It's not, it's not fine, Chair, but as SAA technical at the time, we consider that was the best decision that we did. And in fact, as I am still sitting Which here, decision now? The decision to form a partnership with AAR because the process, the partnership process was embarked into and it was agreed that we needed to form a partnership Hence, the birth of the MOU. Did you get persuaded while you were overseas that AI, being wined and dined by AAR that the way to go would be to retract the, 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 the tender and enter into an MOU with AAR? Is it something you get, got persuaded of when you were no, overseas? No, I cannot Or when you came be, back? I cannot be persuaded by whining and dining of AAR chair because but at what I would be in a position you... to wine and dine myself if I wanted to. At what point did you see this point that the right way to go would be to retract the tender and enter into an MOU with AAR? Was it while you were visiting AAR overseas or was it after you had returned? Of course the MOU, um, I, I, I don't know the date, 
but I would think the MOU would be entered after we have been there and seen the premises and seen what value can they add to SAA Technical. So what you saw on the trip uh, would have in influenced you to say we must go the MOU route? Yes, Chair. Um, so which means it was while you were overseas on this trip that you got persuaded that you must go the MOU we route. Did not, we did not get persuaded, Chair. The, the purpose of our trip was to make sure that we confirm the resources that they said they had in the paper, which we liked that this is the company that we can form a partnership with. So basically, our trip there was to make sure to confirm what was in the paper. It was not for them to persuade us. We acted in the best interest of SAA Technical to enter into that MOU, which expired after six months after all. I'll, uh, I'll let Ms. Hofmeyer uh, uh, ask her next question. But before that, I want to go back to uh, the question of uh, communication with FBDA while uh, a tender is open. The basis on which you have now today said there would have been nothing wrong for you to go on this trip even if you were aware that AAR was one of the bidders in the tender that was still open is that um, the company that is SAA Technical had a rigorous procurement process uh, so, as I understand it, you were not going to be influenced by anything because there is a rigorous um, procurement process. I don't remember you advancing that as the reason yesterday for saying communication between a decision maker could take place, communication could take place between a decision maker in regard to a tender and a director of a company that has put in a bid. I thought you advanced a different basis. Am I right? Am I right in understanding that? Um, I may not have remembered, Chair, what basis did, that adv did I advance. <laughs> However, I remember me saying that there are processes including combined assurance providers. And I mentioned a internal audit external audit, uh, risk management, and management as a whole, which basically would also form part of the chain within the procurement process. I, I seem to think that at least at one stage, the basis you advanced was that uh, as long as the communication did not include discussing the tender, there would be nothing wrong with the decision maker uh, having uh, communication or even having dinner or lunch with the director of a company that had put in a bid in regard to a tender that was still open. Uh, at least that was uh, either the basis you advanced or one of them. Uh, is that your recollection as well? Yes, Chair. And in addition to that, there are these rigorous processes that I told you about today. And more importantly, at SAA, there is a cross-functional team. team, yes, which basically is responsible to make sure that the process is thorough. And in fact, you can even see their minutes that there was a process that was the process that was followed. So in addition to that uh, cross-functional team, there is also the bid adjudication committee, and then there is EXCO. And all of these people basically are the gatekeepers of making sure that procurement processes are followed to 
but we, but we saw yesterday from your evidence how this board of which you were a member at SAA at least, you know, could override a decision by other people in regard to the HF's contract. You, you didn't even want to look at the motivation put up by the acting CEO because you had decided you were going to override them, you were going to over reverse the decision. That's, that, that can happen when people know they've got power. They might disregard whatever other people have said. Chair, I said yesterday, the SF's uh, retraction of that tender was, the, the circumstances were different. Yeah, you don't have I to repeat them. To I, I remember the circumstances you gave. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just saying, but whatever you said, what was quite clear from your evidence was that at least the SAA board of which you are a member, you know, would not hesitate to reverse a decision made by other people within the, within the company and in your case would not even bother to look at the motivation uh, for the decision that they, they, would, they, would, uh, they wanted to re reverse. Ms. Hoffman? Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Quinan, I understood you yesterday to accept in your evidence that as a general principle, boards of state-owned enterprises shouldn't get involved in operational matters. Do you accept that? Yes, Chair. That's left to the management of the SOE, correct? Yes, Chair. So then can you just help me why it was at all necessary for non-executive board members of SAA Technical to go on this due diligence trip at all? Shouldn't that have been left to management? Um, just one sec before she answers, Ms. Mbandu. Uh, thank you, Chair. It was actually a response to what the Chair had put to, to the witness. Yes. And I just want, uh, Chair, to remind you what the evidence of the witness was. Yes. The evidence of the witness was this. The reason why the air chef's uh, tender, that is the award to LSG, was reversed by the board was because of application of a section in the Public Finance Management Act and the fact that that is a tender that ought not to have gone out. Oh, that's, that's, that's what I told her not to remind me because I, I, I remember what her evidence was. Yes, so yeah. it's, 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 I was okay. just correcting the impression that they can override. They don't override, no, no, no. they apply. No, no, no. Um, I, I remembered what, what evidence she, she gave. Ms. Hofmeyer, I think you had asked a yes, question. Yes, I'd yeah. asked why if board members are not supposed to involve themselves in operational matters, it was necessary for non-executive members of the board to go on this trip to do a due diligence. Shouldn't that have been left to management? Um, it has been at SAA Technica. It has been a practice that uh, the board and management do undertake this trip. And it also did happen at, at, uh, at AAR. Both board and management did go to this trip. Why only some board members then? Of course, <laughs> it would depend on the meeting who would be selected to go. And it also would apply with management. Not everybody would go because that would mean that all management, it depends who is nominated to go and represent SAA technical. I can understand that for management. I can't really understand it for non-executive board members. Why should, they, why should some of you have the benefits of this and not others? Uh, Chair, it has, been, it has been the case. People have been are uh, nominated in board meetings. Like for instance, when SAA team went to Lufthansa and when SAA team went to Air France, I was a board member at SAA Technica and I didn't go to these trips. So it depends who is nominated in a meeting to go. So you did it because it was a practice, is that correct? Yes. Did you ever look at whether the practice made sense? For me, it made sense because uh, 
SAA Technical is involved in uh, high value uh, uh, contracts. Mm. And therefore, also as the members of the board, then they needed to go. I really did not see anything wrong. Why would they the need to go? The previous, the previous chairpersons did go, mm -hmm. and I also do not see the reason why they would not go. Well, because... Considering that they have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the companies that SAA Technical enters into are genuine companies, are the companies that have got capacity. Mm -hmm. So I really did not see anything wrong in the board members going in the previous board members going in me remaining behind i really did not see anything wrong well let me put to you what might be wrong you see on your version you went so a due diligence could be done yes. you have a full management team with no doubt the expertise yes. to evaluate the proposed partner mm. they would go they would do the necessary and they would report to you your evidence yesterday is that these SOEs were populated by highly qualified people. And the reason for separation, Ms. Quinana, is precisely because, as the ultimate accounting authority, you must make the final call on these decisions. So you don't want to be influenced along the way. You leave your managers to do operational stuff, to do the nitty gritty of the due diligence. They feed it into you, you assess it, you can go back, you can say it's not good enough, but you don't get on a plane and go and be wined and dined by somebody who is a bidder in a process. Do you accept that that might be a better way to do it? Uh, Chair, this has been the practice, and I do not doubt the intelligence of the people who made those decisions, including my own intelligence, Chair. Ms. Quinana, um, you, ent you come back, right? You retract the tender and you enter into the MOU. And I heard you a moment ago, I think, say entering into that MOU was one of the best decisions that SAA Technical took. Is that correct? Um, that, was, that was the best uh, decision that uh, uh, SAA Technical entered into. The reason being that AAR is uh, providing parts, components, in almost uh, all the airlines, and therefore the reason why uh, SAA Technical has been incurring losses, or one of the reasons, is because we have been using uh, uh, the, the middlemen to get to these papers that AAR is supporting. So that's why I'm saying if and in fact, AAR has got a network all over the world, which SAA Technical would also tap into. So that's why I'm saying it was one of the best decisions that we made. And in fact, Chair, I said uh, the, uh, I don't regret a single decision that I made when I was a, a board member at SAA and SAA Technical, but some of the decisions are definitely better than the others. And this one was one of those. I, I just want to be sure that we're on the same page, because what you've given now, as I understand your evidence, is a justification for choosing AAR ultimately to be the component supplier. But your evidence earlier was that deciding to in, uh, embark on the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding with AAR, was one of the best decisions that yes, the board sure. has taken. Do you yes. stand by that? Yes. Sure. Why was it abandoned a month later then? It's because the terms and conditions was that after, I think it was six months, it was a six months MOU, the terms and conditions required that after six months, if nothing, if no relationship happens, then it needed to be uh, uh, cancelled. No, that so. would explain why six months later it didn't continue. It was reversed a month after it was entered into. How could that be a good decision? Um, I may not remember about the reversal mm. a month after. Um, my recollection is that that MOU was a six months contract, six months mm. MOU, and after six months it expired. So the one month, uh, I really do not remember. 
Okay, but in your mind, even from as early as that trip, I understand your evidence to be you had identified AAR as an excellent supplier of component parts. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you believe that for SAA Technical to partner with AAR would be one of the best things that it could do. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Right. Um, Mr. Parsons, who was your co-board member around this time, had some concerns about that MOU. Are you aware of them? Hey, you know, I don't even want to talk about uh, Mr. Parsons, the reason being that he was not even supposed to be in that boat because he was in a, 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 an illegal immigrant. Uh, anyway, um, I... Are you aware that he had concerns? That's the question. Uh, I, I'm aware that he had concerns and I even wrote him a let an email to say, uh, Barry, let us meet so that I can hear your concerns. And to be honest, Chair, that email that Barry wrote, I did not even understand what he was complaining about. What I know is that he was very, very disgruntled yeah, that no, he didn't go to Chicago. Yeah, no, asked about that email as yet, Ms. Hoffman. So you said he was disgruntled that he didn't get to go on the trip? Yes. Oh, all right. So did, did you surmise that he writes this letter because he didn't get on the trip with you to the US. Yes, sir. Do you have any facts to back that up? Um, the reason is that he was doing the walkabout with AAR people uh, at SAA Technical, and he supported uh, this thing, uh, the, 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 the partnership, and he was... Uh, very supportive and he liked it and then all of a sudden now uh, uh, he turns around and uh, and write that email and mm -hmm. subsequently resigns so the trip was really something that mattered to the board members correct yes the trip mattered to the mm. board members mm. yes. and he'd been excluded so he felt left out is that no, your version he, he was part of that meeting that decided who should go but he held some uh, discomfort or uh, frustration maybe about the fact that he wasn't selected correct uh, everybody in the board meeting mm. needs uh, needs to decide mm. It's not only one person who decides. Everybody decides. No, indeed. He also had an opportunity of deciding mm. and make a recommendation mm. as it, to who should go. Yeah, Ms. Quinana, it's not about, about that. I mean, Ms. Hofmeyer is really asking, uh, is following up on your evidence that uh, he was disgruntled. Did, did he ever say, I want to go at the, at the board meeting? I don't remember him saying he wants to go because if he wanted to go, obviously that would be discussed and then um, a decision would have been made to say, yes, you can go or you can't go with some reasons. Do you know of any reason why if he wanted to go, he would not have uh, expressed that wish at the, at the board meeting? Uh, even... Uh, uh, I later came to understand. No, 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 Ms. Quinana. Do you know of any reason why, if he wanted to go on the trip, he would not have expressed that wish at the meeting? Yes, Chair. Because what is the reason that you know? I know that he, his, uh, his stay in, in South Africa had, was illegal at the time, and therefore it would be difficult for him to, to get out of the country. So why would he be disgruntled about not being nominated to go on a trip on which he could not go anyway, even if he wanted to? Where's the logic in that? But, uh, basically, Chair, that's the only reason why I would think that all of a sudden, after the trip, he resigns. 
Otherwise, that's no, but also let's my talk about, speculation. Let's talk about your evidence that he was disgruntled because he was not allowed to go on the trip. He was not nominated. If, he, if on your evidence, he knew that he couldn't go out of the country, how could he be disgruntled about not being nominated? Because even if he had been nominated, he would have been bound to decline. Doesn't make sense, does it? That, that is the speculation, Chair, because I, I, as I am sitting here, and, uh, but your speculation has no basis. It doesn't make sense. You are saying he could not leave the country because he was illegal and he knew it in the country. And then you say he was disgruntled because he was not nominated to go on the trip. But if he knew that he was illegal and therefore could not get out of the country, logically, he could not be disgruntled about something that he could not take advantage of. Maybe, Chair, he was disgruntled because he could not go to Is that Chicago, another speculation? Not, not being nominated, but he could not go. Is that another speculation? It's, it's a speculation, Chair, because I, I don't understand his email. Ms. Hoffman. And you yeah. see, his letter is very clear about his reasons. Right, His letter, which you will find in your bundle, Ms. Quinana, at DD 33, page 22. So we're at exhibit DD 33, page 22. Do I need 22. to go there? No, Chair. Yeah. I'm just okay. going to read the yeah. two okay. points that he makes that I'd like to pick up on. Because Ms. Quinana has said that she doesn't understand from this letter, as I have it, why he was leaving. Is that your evidence, Ms. Quinana? Yes, Chair. Right. He says... Uh, please accept my resignation with immediate effect from the Board of Directors of SAA Technical. I feel I've made a strong contribution to the Board, finding governance in the business week after what happened, of, uh, what appeared years of neglect. Unfortunately, the value I can add seems no longer wanted, as it is quite clearly due to the AAR Corporation's strategic partnership. There is clearly a hidden agenda somewhere in this relationship and it requires urgent, independent investigation. So as I read that, he's communicating that he's concerned that there's something hidden in this relationship that SAA Technical is forging with AAR. Do you understand it in the same way? Yes, sure. Yes. What is not uh, clear about that reason? What is not clear is that this person was very excited about this relationship and he was the person who was walking the AAR team about. And then now, all of a sudden, he writes this letter. So basically, I just do not understand. But that well, might be precisely because he has realized that there's something hidden that he doesn't agree with. That's why he, his attitude changes. That's... That's logic. Maybe, Chair, that's what he should have written. That hidden agenda. He could, he, would, he could have said, I think there's a hidden agenda, the hidden agenda being A, B, C, D, and E. Yes, he does do that. <laughs> so, you oh, see, oh, he goes go on. Further. He explains precisely what his concerns are. He talks about the irregular way in which the MOU was concluded. He'd raised a series of concerns about it, so not where least are these of which... concerns, Chair? Can you take Ms. us to Quinana, wait until Ms. Hofmeyer has finished what she has to say. Ms. Quinana, I'm trying to summarise. We can read every word of this letter if it's necessary. It mm. was in your bundle, so I assume you've taken some time to look at it beforehand. I'm summarising now, but if you would like to go through it yourself, you must let us know. He, in essence, says the following. He had reservations about the conclusion of the MOU. He raises the concern about when it was entered into because there were certain time periods that were supposed to run and it was unclear when it was entered into. That appears in much more detail before this letter, but here he is summarising it. And then importantly, in the penultimate paragraph on page 23, he says, my other specific concern is the identification and selection of the triple BEE partners, if any, for the proposed joint venture, a process that needs to be highly transparent, 
in a business that already has an uncompetitive cost base. The copy of the MOU received includes an implementation timetable that suggests this process may already be significantly advanced. And there's no visibility of this to either the SAA technical or SAA boards or national treasury. He concludes, I hope the company shares my concerns and appreciate that I have no confidence in the integrity of the SAA technical board and my membership of that board has become a reputational matter and it is a simple decision to submit my resignation. What did you not understand about that, Ms. Quinana? Um, I still do not understand when he talks about um, the identification and the selection of the BE partners. Um, I also do not understand um, uh, the MOU, what is not clear about the MOU. And another thing, for him being a board member, uh, he should have raised these issues in a meeting. And then now, he just resigns without raising uh, the issues and get them properly uh, attended to. So basically, I really do not understand. And uh, the, if, for instance, he's talking about the AAR and the identification and the selection of the BE partners, and in fact, all other companies, we do not, of course, we have got a list of the BEE companies that would want that that, that uh, would want to do business with SAA. But now the selection of the BE partners also do follow a rigorous process to be included in the database of the BEEs. So basically, if uh, Barry, uh, uh, Mr. Parsons had a problem with that. He was a board member. He had the platform to raise his issues and made sure that they are properly communicated. As I said, I needed to have a meeting with him and then we decide what needs to happen. And instead of us meeting, he just resigned. So basically, I don't understand a person at his level who has the platform to put together what his concerns are, is unable to do that, and he simply resigns. Okay, um, it's about lunchtime, but Ms. Mbandra had a hand up. Ms. No. Mbandra? Uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity, but Mrs. Quinana has already... Has uh, taken uh, care of it. Yes, okay, all right. Uh, Ms. Hofmeyer, shall we take the lunch break now? Indeed, Chair. Okay, it's five past one. We will resume at five past two. We are Jen.